I do have slides, but I think that, yeah, hi. Um, I just, you know, I have slides, um, but I think it's easy enough to share them as long as when I go up, you make me a co-host, right? Yes. Cool. All right.
Good morning, everyone. Um, hello, workshop attendees, panelists, and invited guests. Um, my name is Matthew Thomas. I am the outgoing editor-in-chief of the Emory Bankruptcy Developments Journal. Um, I've had many honors during my tenure as the editor-in-chief of the EBDGA, but certainly one of my most distinct honors has been working with all of the folks who have um, made this workshop possible and who have made our forthcoming special issue, the developments issue, a reality. Um, though I am certain to, to miss some folks in my opening regards, um, I'd, I'd like to kick off the workshop by issuing some words of gratitude to folks who helped get this event off the ground um, and, and folks who helped get the special issue um, itself off the ground. So first, I'd like to thank members of the Emory Law community for their assistance and constant support. I thank Dean Marianne Babinski and the Law School for continuing to believe in the journal by providing it resources um, and, as mentioned, support at every junction. Um, furthermore, this event would have not been possible without um, Associate Dean Susan Clark, Associate Dean Courtney Stombach, Dania Duran, Amy Marcellana. Um, and furthermore, this event and the journal, um, everything that we've done this year would not have happened but for the tireless work of the managing staff editor, Ms. Rhonda Herman. Um, she is truly a hero um, to me and, and all of the law journals at Emory Law. Next, I would like to thank um, the EBDJ's faculty advisor and a great mentor of mine, Professor Rafael Pardo. Professor Pardo's learned insights and unwavering support for the journal and its members were essential to the success of um, the planning of this event um, and, and the success of the journal at large this year. Professor Pardo was um, furthermore instrumental in helping the journal on the idea of this special issue um, and developing a workshop with the authors that will be publishing in the special this year. For this and so much more, I, I deeply thank our faculty advisor, Professor Pardo. Um, and of course, there would be no special issue and no workshop without the great authors that we will have presenting today. We are incredibly fortunate to have seven, seven authors working with us on this project. Um, and with my deepest gratitude, I think um, first, uh, Professor George Triantis, um, next, Professor Jared Elias, um, Professor Laura Napoli Cords, Professor Odette Lanau, Professor Anthony Casey, Professor Joshua Macy, um, and Professor Jay Westbrook, um, the, the authors who will be publishing in our developments issue and who you will hear from today. I thank the professors not only for accepting the invitation to publish with the EBDJ, but for taking time out of their schedules to be here today um, for responding to my and Vera's um, many and constant emails at times um, and for working on what was a mightily aggressive timeline to develop works of bankruptcy scholarship that are tackling some of the most pressing issues today. Thank you all so very much. Finally, I want to extend some words of gratitude to um, Mr. Harrison Pewter and Vera Bespalova. Um, these are the EBDJ members who principally planned and executed this event. Vera has demonstrated capable leadership um, and this event would be completely without legs, without Vera's hard work. I will now pass this event over to Vera, who will outline the event at large um, and provide, on some, pr provide information on some logistics um, for the day. Thank you so much, Matthew, for those kind words. It really has been a pleasure to plan the developments issue and this workshop with you over the past several months. Our vision for the special issue was to highlight the recent developments in the bankruptcy world and how bankruptcy can serve as a tool in the aftermath of COVID-19 and the economic downturn that has resulted. Our authors have put together an amazing lineup of essays and we're really excited to hear from them today. Before we get started, I wanna give everybody a rundown of today's schedule and logistics for the workshop. During the first half of the day, Professor Cords will present, followed by Professor Lanau and finally Professors Macy and Casey. We will then take a break for lunch from 12.30 until 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. When we reconvene, Professors Triantis and Elias will present, followed by Professor Westbrook, who will close out our presentations. Each presentation will be 45 minutes long, which includes time for questions. Panelists, we ask that you use the chat function and send in your questions or just unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and ask the question yourself. Uh, anyone who is not a panelist can ask questions by using the Q&A function on Zoom. We will give a chance for panelists to ask questions first before moving on to those sent in through Q&A. Thank you again uh, for all of our authors for being here today and for all of our attendees joining us from all across the country.
I will now pass the mic on to Dean Fabinski, who will be giving opening remarks. Dean Fabinski. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you here. Uh, you've already received uh, wonderful words of welcome and thanks from Matthew Thomas, whose leadership has also been quite important to the journal over the past year. But I do want to take a few moments uh, to recognize the significance of today's event uh, and to thank a few additional people for their roles uh, today. Uh, first of all, as you all know, the Emory Bankruptcy and Developments Journal uh, is one of uh, Emory's key journals. We have a strong presence and activity and uh, range of business and transactional law areas. Uh, and we're able to do that in part uh, because of student dedication to the EBBJ. Um, it's been such a strong journal over time, published wonderful student scholarship, uh, highly impactful uh, scholarship from faculty members and, and others. Uh, and it's a core part of our overall presence in business and transactional law nationally and internationally. And I just wanted to recognize uh, the journal uh, and its importance. Uh, second of all, this workshop that they've elected to uh, carry for this year is just one example of their commitment to trying to ensure that you have access to the very best scholarship and thought in ways in which bankruptcy and restructuring and, and the legal principles in these areas have a fundamental impact on our society. Uh, and it's clearly extremely important that we have the opportunity to hear from our authors today uh, as they talk about the impact of these areas of law as we emerge, we hope, we're using these, these hopeful words these days, as we emerge from the COVID pandemic, which we know has had such a profound uh, economic impact in our society. And so I commend the, the students in particular uh, for having organized uh, this particular workshop with a strong support uh, from Professor Pardo uh, and others in that effort. Um, as you uh, know, it's, um, there are many people to thank in, a, in an event like this. Um, I, Matt, as I said, is, has given many thanks already, but I do uh, need to reinforce uh, some, of, uh, some of that gratitude here. Uh, for uh, Vera Vespolova and Harrison Pewter, uh, for example, whose leadership of this particular workshop and issue has been key to its success. Uh, Raph Pardo, who, who um, advises the students and dedicates so much time to that effort and also has advised me over time as Dean. Uh, about how best to support uh, bankruptcy and the work of our students moving forward, uh, a huge source of wisdom for the law school as a whole. So thank you, Professor Pardo. Uh, staff, Rhonda Hermans, Amy Marcellana, and others who, who uh, Matthew mentioned, um, and also uh, the sponsors, the firms and individuals who supported this journal since its inception, and all the attendees who've taken time uh, today. It's a quite impressive list uh, who will be joining the workshop over the course of the day judges who have put their judicial matters to one side to attend, law professors from around the nation and around the world, bankruptcy law clerks, some of them from Emory, uh, as well as some other ones, um, and uh, who, who've taken time to participate, uh, lawyers from across the country, some of whom are EBBJ alumni, uh, members of the Atlanta and Houston bars, uh, friends of the law school and of the journal in particular, uh, who are taking part today. And in particular, of course, I want to thank the uh, issue authors and the workshop participants. We're incredibly fortunate to have some of the brightest scholars in bankruptcy law in the entire world uh, here today to consider this important topic. Uh, all of those uh, mentioned by Matt uh, a few moments ago, and I'll just say, make particular note of Professor Westbrook, who served as an anchor panelist uh, for this since the inception of the event and truly special to have your participation. So it's impossible to to say um, in detail uh, how grateful we are for all of you, but I hope these few brief remarks uh, express our gratitude for your participation today, for your part in making this event a success, and also our good wishes. I hope you have an excellent workshop today uh, discussing these important topics, and I am now very pleased and honored uh, to invite Professor Cords uh, to begin her presentation. Thank you all. Well. Thank you, Dean Bobinski, and thank you very much to Vera and Matthew and the entire Emory Bankruptcy Developments Journal team for the invitation to contribute an essay and for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm just going to take a moment and share my screen. Um, I hope, is that, can everybody see my screen, the PowerPoint? <laughs> yes, looks great. 
Thank you. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> it's always, it's always a little bit of a gamble on zoom. Um, <laughs> so, um, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. This paper is, uh, this essay is about the problems that come when we create an entity that doesn't fit neatly within pre-existing identifying categories. And to that end, I'd like to sort of kick things off by talking about what the, um, sorry, I'm hoping my, my slide will go. Um, what exactly the United States Postal Service is. Um, and it's, it's somewhat easier in a sense to describe what it is not. <laughs> um, so uh, the US Supreme Court in 2004 um, described in, a, in an antitrust case actually, described the United States Postal Service as an independent establishment of the executive branch. And um, that, um, was the, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get my, my notes up here. <laughs> um, so that, that, that was the, um, the, the definition for the antitrust case, um, which indicates or seemed to indicate that the USPS is a government agency. However, the USPS has a high degree of independence from the government and functions in many ways like a private business. And so although the USPS is technically within the agency box, at least for antitrust purposes. Um, functionally speaking, it doesn't act much like an agency. Um, it's intended to be self-sufficient. It's increasingly been designed to work like a private business um, over the years. And I think that's, that last part is, is important because the Supreme Court's characterization of the USPS, sorry, um, the Supreme Court's characterization of the USPS came after or came prior to the passage of a 2006 act that even more fundamentally uh, reshaped the USPS and attempted to make it operate even more like a private business. Um, and so I don't think even though the, the Supreme Court has kind of to some extent said this is like this is a government agency, I don't think we can necessarily definitively say that it is because functionally it's so different um, from the government agencies that we're used to. It's not quite a government owned corporation either. And granted, if you look at the definition or try to define what a government owned corporation is, that definition itself can be somewhat amorphous. Um, although the USPS operates like a business, it is controlled by presidential appointees, um, the, a board of governors, and by the postmaster general. It also has distinct privileges that other government owned corporations lack. And so it doesn't quite fit neatly in the box of government owned corporation either. And then it's certainly not a private business, although I think there are folks out there that would like to make it more like a private business. Um, it has many privileges that private businesses do not have, such as sovereign immunity and uh, the power of eminent domain and a monopoly over mail services. And it doesn't have to comply with other, many other rules that apply to businesses, although it is in some ways much more constrained than a business. Um, and I'll talk about those ways, of course. So what exactly is it, right? It doesn't fit neatly into sort of any of these three boxes. Um, it has been described uh, by scholars, um, by uh, uh, legislators as a quasi-independent, quasi-governmental establishment of the federal government. And that definition doesn't seem to help much either because it doesn't really provide an independent descriptor. We're still defining this entity in half measures. It's quasi this, quasi that. Um, and we're still defining it as much by what it isn't as by what it is. And so I think we can, what we can say for certain is that in practice, the USPS is somewhat of a hybrid entity, right? It doesn't fit neatly into any of these boxes. And so I wanna talk about that today. And I wanna talk about the, the issues that that poses for the USPS, which is suffering from financial distress and the limitations that that, that, that presents um, for restructuring and for financial relief. Um, so I'm going to basically start off by talking about how we got to where we are today, how the post office um, transformed into the USPS, which is the entity that we have today, um, and how we sort of, what, what the original vision was and how that's changed over time. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about, financially speaking, what's going on with the USPS, what are the problems that it's having, and how its structure uh, contributes to those problems. Then we'll talk about why we, as people who care about bankruptcy law, should care about this, even though I agree with uh, the assessment of the National Bankruptcy Conference and many other experts that bankruptcy is probably not the path forward for the USPS. And finally, I'll talk about what we should do about it or what I think we can do about it, um, at least you know, uh, as a first step. <laughs> 
Before I get to all of this, I think it's important to go over some quick terminology, and I will try to stick with this as best as I can uh, throughout my talk, um, because the, again, part of the problem is the USPS is, is difficult to define. Um, so I'll use the phrase USPS to talk about the current iteration of our postal service provider, the current entity that provides us with our postal services. I'll just use the term post office to refer to the older iterations, the predecessor of our current day USPS. Uh, the post office is gonna refer to a time when the post office was more substantially a part of the federal government. And I'll use the term postal service as a generic term for postal related services. So mail delivery, for example. With that, and hopefully I can stick with that terminology, <laughs> um, I will talk a little bit about how we got here. Um, and so I wanna start actually with the original vision of what postal services would look like in the United States, which goes back to before the constitution. Um, and you know, even you know, predates the, 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 the country in some ways. Um, and so you know, early on, very early on, the framers recognized that postal services were very important to the country, to the young country. Um, and so in the constitution, they provided Congress with the power to establish and regulate postal services and post roads. And so this became, um, you know, postal services, I should say, became officially linked to the federal government with the Postal Services Act of 1792, which was signed into law by President George Washington. And the purpose of the then post office was to bind the nation together through the personal, educational, literary, and business correspondence of the people. And in the early years, the Postal Service was very closely linked to the federal government. Um, so again, as of 1792, with the Postal Services Act, the post office officially became a part of the federal government. In the 1800s, the Postmaster General became a member of the president's cabinet. So the post office was actually a cabinet level agency in the early days. Um, and so the post office department was, its identity was clear. It was a federal agency and it was recognized as such. Nevertheless, uh, you know, there were some problems with that setup and the post office soon began to experience financial problems. In the 1840s, we saw the first taxpayer funded bailout of the post office after competitors, private companies began taking advantage of steamboats and the railway to offer competing services at lower prices. And the post office really struggled with competing with these private companies. And so Congress provided a bailout um, and then eliminated competition. Um, so at, in the 1840s, Congress passed a law providing that the post office was given a monopoly over letter carrying. Um, so we got rid of all those private companies that were competing by steamboat and by rail and were able to provide um, you know, services uh, for the, on the chief and, and compete with the post office. That all was done away with in the 1840s. In the 1850s, 1851 specifically, Congress created its first annual appropriation for the post office. And so every year thereafter, um, there was money in the budget for the post office. Still in the, 19, in the early 1900s, the post office required a second taxpayer funded bailout. Um, and this was justified, you know, I really both of the taxpayer funded bailouts, I should say, were justified by the, um, the concept that the post office had what's called a universal service obligation, an obligation to provide mail delivery to every American, no matter where they were located, no matter how far flung within the boundaries of the United States. Um, but you know, the United States was a growing country, right? And um, very often a rural country in many ways. And so the, you know, the post office had to provide these services to every person, um, regardless of their, their location, rural, urban, um, you know, far flung or, or close to a major city. Um, and so because of this universal service obligation, it was seen, you know, the, the post office was providing this service, this public service to every American and uh, living within the United States. And therefore, you know, when the post office ran into financial difficulty, the American public had to bail it out essentially. <laughs> um, so this was how things went roughly until the 1960s. And in the 1960s, we saw um, the beginning of sort of a breakdown, I think I characterize it as pushback on the slide, but it was sort of a breakdown of the system. Letter carriers, many of whom were 
paid so poorly that they were living off of food stamps and welfare, began to fight for better pay and better working conditions. At the same time, the post office was trying to save money and cut costs, um, similar to actually what happened um, recently with, with the pandemic, cost cutting attempts led to a backlog of mail. In this case, the backlog was so serious that in 1964, Christmas gifts were still being delivered on Valentine's Day. Um, so that was a pretty significant mail backlog. We're not just talking a backlog of a couple of days. And in 1968, in testimony before Congress, the postmaster general said, this agency is in a race with catastrophe. And so the uh, presidential commission was formed in the late 1960s to research a new approach. They said, what we have here isn't working. Um, the post office is, is, is not, is, is sort of losing money. Um, our model isn't, isn't very good. And the presidential commission did a bunch of research and ultimately recommended that the post office be sort of cut off from the government a little bit and run more like a business. Um, the postal unions pushed back. They didn't want this. They wanted the sort of safety of, the, of a government job, among other things. Um, and things came to a head in, the 19, in 1970 when letter carriers across the country went on strike for eight days. So at, uh, during that time period, the unions sat down with the government and they hammered out a compromise. The unions promised to support a reorganization of the post office, while the government promised higher pay and collective bargaining rights. Um, and this resulted, this compromise resulted in the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, which was signed into law by President Nixon. The Postal Reorganization Act dramatically changed the, the structure of the post office. It changed, first of all, our postal service provider from a cabinet level government agency, what I've been referring to as the post office, to something more akin to a government owned company, again, not quite fitting in that box, um, but the United States Postal Service, the USPS. And the goal behind the USPS was that it was supposed to be self-funded and self-sufficient. Um, in order to assist the USPS with becoming self-sufficient, um, the USPS retained the post office's monopoly over letter carrying. But of course, it lost all of those appropriations and government subsidies that it had had for decades prior. And ever since 1982, the USPS has been operating without taxpayer funds. And so, Essentially what happened is the compromise that resulted in the Postal Reorganization Act or the PRA created a hybrid entity. The USPS is technically still part of the government. It's technically part of the executive branch, but it's overseen by a board of governors and it operates in many ways more like a business than a government agency. At the same time, Congress has retained a lot of control over the USPS as evidenced by the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006. Um, so this act restricted, uh, in many ways, put new restrictions, I should say, on the USPS. In particular, it restricted the USPS's ability to innovate. Um, with this act, Congress narrowly defined postal services um, to really only include things like mail delivery, letter carrying, package delivery, that type of thing. Um, and it said, you know, you can't innovate and provide other services like FedEx or UPS can, um, or even you know, Amazon today, right? You can't look into sort of providing those other services. Your job is to provide postal services. In addition, the PAEA <laughs> um, required the USPS to pay in advance for future employees retirement benefits 75 years out. And this, is, this was incredibly unique. It's something that no other agency and no other business has to do, this kind of, this level of sort of pre-funding of benefits. It also tied the USPS's uh, pricing for its key products to the consumer price index. So if there's no inflation, the USPS is unable to increase prices. This is problematic because the USPS's congressionally imposed obligations, particularly pre-funding, um, but are growing faster than the rate of inflation. And so over the years, what I think we can see um, in terms of how we got to where we are today is that in some ways, Congress has cut the USPS loose from the federal government. And in other ways, it's tightened its grip over how it functions, how it operates. And so it reminds me of the, you know, the parent that whose child is going away to college and you're just not sure how much to free reign to give them. Um, and so it, it's, it looks very much like that. We've, in some ways we've, we've said, you know, we don't have the post office, this cabinet level agency anymore, um, but we're not quite ready to say, let's make this a fully privatized, you know, business. <laughs> 
So this brings me to sort of what's wrong with the USPS or what's going on with the USPS today. So last year, the Government Accountability Office released a report on the USPS and its financial predicament because the USPS is in a severe financial predicament. And it identified three primary problems that are affecting the USPS today. The first has to do with declining mail volume, which I'm sure all of us are familiar with. As people turn to email um, more and more, as we can conduct business online, as we can pay our bills online, um, the demand for you know, snail mail, traditional mail has gone way down. Unlike a private business, of course, the USPS is limited in the ways that it can adjust to or adapt to this decline in demand. As I mentioned, the PAEA, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, limits the USPS's ability to provide products and services, or restricts, I should say, the USPS's ability to provide products and services that are not postal services, so that are not really that are not related to letter carrying, mail delivery, package delivery. Um, in addition, as I mentioned as well, the USPS cannot adjust prices or is limited in the scope and the way in which it can adjust prices in order to correspond to supply and demand. Um, in addition, the USPS cannot simply close its retail facilities, so its post offices, um, simply because they're unprofitable. Uh, that's not enough. It has to do, it has to basically do more, engage in a more thorough assessment before it can close a retail facility down. And so the USPS is operating many of these facilities across the country, essentially at a loss, um, and is, is very constrained as to, in, as to whether it can actually close them down. The second problem with the USPS is that its costs are increasing, particularly compensation and benefits costs. Um, although the USPS has cut workers, um, so its workforce has diminished uh, in recent years, its workers are working longer hours, which is resulting in mandated, federally mandated overtime pay. And so the cost of employing these workers isn't really going down. The USPS is also statutorily mandated to pay its employees a certain amount and to provide certain benefits, so it can't get out of that. And it's bound to collective bargaining agreements with its employees, many of which or I should say the terms of many of these agreements were set by an arbitration panel after the parties failed to agree. And so they're set in binding arbitration and the USPS doesn't have much control over sort of whether it can um, adjust those um, obligations. And then finally, um, again, it's unfunded liabilities and debt are increasing as well. And this is thanks in part to the 2006 uh, Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act, which was requiring it to sort of prefund its employees um, uh, retirement obligations. And so I think if we, if I could encapsulate what's wrong with the USPS very briefly, I would say the biggest problem is that it's not fulfilling Congress's vision um, of, of, the, uh, of the USPS. It's not fulfilling this vision of a self-sufficient entity, but it's not self-sufficient in part because Congress keeps messing with it, <laughs> to put it <laughs> very frankly. Um, so this gets us to, you know, why, why, does, why should this interest us as bankruptcy scholars and bankruptcy practitioners? Why should we care about the USPS? What, is, what implications does this have for us? Um, before I began researching this paper, you know, my instinct was that the USPS was um, an entity that I have referred to, a type of entity that I've referred to in prior work as a bankruptcy misfit, um, an entity that needed bankruptcy but just couldn't get the relief because it was ineligible. Um, but I think that initial assessment is incorrect, um, as I've done, you know, further research. But I do think to some extent, my feeling was shared by some in the government because the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, asked the National Bankruptcy Conference to assess whether bankruptcy would be a viable option for the USPS. Um, and the National Bankruptcy Conference said, uh, there's a couple of problems with making the USPS eligible for bankruptcy. I think first of all, there's a classification problem. Um, now, out, granted, outside of the bankruptcy context, in that USPS versus Flamingo Industries case, the Supreme Court did characterize the USPS as a governmental entity of some sort. They didn't use the term governmental agency exactly, but they seem to indicate that the USPS was a part of the federal government. This means it's ineligible for Chapter 11, um, but it's also ineligible for Chapter 9 because it's an instrument, If it, to the extent that it's anything, it's an instrumentality of the federal government rather than an instrumentality of the state. So it doesn't qualify for municipal bankruptcy either. 
However, the National Bankruptcy Conference found that even if Congress made the USPF eligible for bankruptcy somehow by amending the bankruptcy code, by providing some path forward, maybe a modified chapter 11 or some modified version of chapter nine, bankruptcy still wouldn't work to resolve the vast majority of the USPS's problems. And that's because the USPS's most significant financial burdens and the constraints that it faces in dealing with those burdens are all imposed by federal statute. And so essentially the National Bankruptcy Conference concluded, this is a problem that Congress has created and Congress should fix this problem. In essence, Congress has created an entity that is bankruptcy proof. It's completely subject to Congress's own management or mismanagement, depending on who you ask, and it's at the mercy of Congress. And I think this is important because it shows us in a way the limits of bankruptcy law and what bankruptcy can accomplish. I think especially in times of crisis, like today with the pandemic and all of the fallout from that, a lot of the reactions that we see it, um, you know, focus on bankruptcy as a solution to the various problems that, that people and that entities are facing. But bankruptcy isn't a solution here. Um, and this shows, I think, as well, this, this illustrates the dangers of Congress creating an entity whose identity is unclear. Um, and what I mean by that is, okay, we know that maybe bankruptcy isn't the best option, but what do we do? What do we do with the USPS? And if we don't know exactly what the USPS is, if we don't know how to classify it, if it doesn't fit neatly into any of the normal boxes that we're used to dealing with, how can we properly assess and evaluate its options for financial relief? So this brings me to, you know, sort of what do we do? How do we move forward from this? And my suggestion in the essay is to restructure the USPS and essentially put it in one box or another, maybe make it either a fully private business or make it a full-fledged government agency, essentially take it out of limbo so that we have at least some clarity as to entity type, and then we can better assess the financial options going forward. There are many, um, uh, folks out there that have written um, about the advantages of privatization of the postal uh, of the USPS. Um, and so I'll just touch briefly on a few of them here. Um, but one of the options, you know, one of the one of the biggest arguments that proponents of privatization make is that it allows for innovation. <laughs> um, if we're if we're if we can innovate, if we can think beyond the provision of basic postal services that Congress is sort of mandate of the USPS focus on, and um, we might be able to address our difficulties better. Opening the USPS up to competition may also improve services. Many proponents of privatization point to Europe. So some European countries, at least to, to varying degrees, have privatized their own postal services. And so many of the proponents of privatization point to Europe and say, it's going pretty well over there. Can we try something similar here? Um, and then I think, you know, complete privatization, making it a private company, gives it that access to bankruptcy. Treating the USPS like any other business makes it easier to access debt relief in the form of bankruptcy. That's not necessarily a reason to privatize it, but that's a consideration. And I think that consideration has to be a part of any larger discussion about what we do moving forward. The biggest, um, and again, there are several disadvantages to privatization that, um, myself and others have identified. But you know, one of the biggest concerns I think is that the USPS, if it were a private company, would no longer be able to fulfill its public mission of providing universal service, um, particularly because it's not very profitable to deliver to rural areas. Um, and uh, the concern would be that if the USPS is giving up its universal service obligation because such obligation is, no long, is not, not profitable, um, this would harm communities that are already underserved. In terms of thinking about returning it back to sort of the wing of the government more fully, um, I think you know there's a couple of thoughts here in terms of you know the advantages of this. One might be that you know we might need Congress and hence taxpayers to do something about the USPS's financial predicament anyway. Um, essentially, it might need a bailout in the near future, <laughs> and so you know potentially we might feel better about a bailout if we. Are, are coupling that bailout with a serious restructuring and maybe a restructuring where we say the government's taking it back under its wing. Um, if it, the USPS were a full-fledged government agency in every sense of the word and acted more like a government agency, um, it would not have bankruptcy access, but it would have access to taxpayer funds. You know, many of our agencies are taxpayer funded. And so 
again, it's kind of the same idea. If we treat the USPS like a governmental agency and put it fully in that box, it makes it easier to know what its options are when it's facing financial difficulties. Um, and of course, an advantage here would be that um, making it a, govern a, full, a fuller government agency would al better align it with its public oriented mission and universal service obligation. Of course, there are disadvantages to the agency model as well, namely that we tried it before and it stopped, it didn't work out so well. Um, and that, you know, in many ways, the USPS has to function like a business. And if we are putting the USPS under the wing of a dysfunctional Congress or a dysfunctional government, that could have negative implications as well. Um, so I think there's, I want to be clear that I think there's a lot more work to be done than can be done in this essay to get the USPS restructured. And I'm not um, outlining a full, you know, uh, proposal of a restructuring. Um, but I do think, and the purpose of this essay is really to argue that clarifying the identity of the USPS will almost certainly help matters from a financial relief perspective. Um, because again, if we're not quite sure what something is, we're likely equally unsure of how to address its financial problems. And right now, the USPS really has access to neither bailout nor bankruptcy, and it's struggling. And all of the warning signs are there and have been there for some time that the USPS really can't continue on as it is. And figuring out what the USPS is and what we want it to be is a critical first step toward figuring out what financial relief mechanisms are appropriate for it. And I argue it should be a consideration in any restructuring of the USPS's organizational structure. So with that, I will stop um, and thank you again very much. And I look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Cords. We will first open it to fellow panelists. Um, if fellow panelists want to either raise their hands or unmute, we will recognize you that way. And then we will open it up to the general attendee list. Uh, hi, uh, it's uh, George Trian is here. Let me. Just there we go. Uh, hi, Laura. Thank you very much for that um, uh, for that essay and as as well for the um, for your presentation. I wanted to ask you if we can unpack a little bit some of the factors because um, clearly one of the problems that you identified is the um, is the lack of clarity in this hybrid entity. And um, if we set that aside. I think you've said something that is uh, even broader and that's important. So supposing there's complete clarity that it's a private um, uh, corporation, let's say, you still have the problem of the straitjacket that it's in. And it's quite possible that even a private entity could be regulated in a way that limited its innovation, that required it to make payments, you know, that, that was bound by a collective agreement with its unit. There's all these things that are hampering the restructuring could exist even if it's a even if it's a private entity. In which case the company, I presume you'd say, would go into bankruptcy. And unless Congress acted to relax those straitjackets. Uh, it would similarly really not have a prospect of being able to be restructured. So uh, I think maybe what you've identified is a broader problem of bankruptcy when there are when there's very, very tight regulation. And I think also the, the question of a bailout is can be separated from the hybrid nature of the USPS because of course private entities are bailed out as well, and the bail bailouts are subject to conditions, uh, et cetera. So it wouldn't have to be a, a, a government agency in order to be bailed out. So I just wonder whether there are two sets of, of obstacles here. The one is the lack of clarity, which of course goes to the statutory entitlement to file for bankruptcy. But the other one is the heavy regulation, and also on the flip side, how to structure the bailout, and if the bailout is structured, whether bankruptcy can be uh, of any help there. So thank you very much, though. It was very, very interesting topic and nice analysis. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And I think you're, you're right. I mean, I think part of what I'm trying to do is say, like, let's get rid, like, let's pull out the problem of lack of clarity and let's, let's address that. But you're absolutely right that, and this is something that I've, I've studied as well, which is, you know, bankruptcy 
um, faces many obstacles in uh, when we're talking about companies that are heavily regulated, um, and you know, very often isn't a good fit there either. And so. I don't think I don't mean to suggest that, you know, if we make it clear what it is that automatically we're going to have those solutions just readily available. I still think there's going to be there's going to have to be a lot of conversation. But I think one of the things that this has shown me or our experience has shown me is that when we're thinking about how to design the USPS and how to modify it, we're not really thinking about, well, what if it gets into financial trouble and what do we do about it? And so I'm trying to pull out that first, that as a first matter, but I think you're absolutely right. Like there will have to be more conversations about, um, you know, even if we get to the point where we put it in a pre-existing box, you know, how do we design a financial relief system that is responsive to its needs and that you know it is the, is the right system, so to speak? Um, and so this is I just see it as sort of a very tiny first step on a much longer road um, to, to restructure the post office. And maybe I'll write a longer paper that that has um, that has more on this. But it's really sort of piqued my interest because it's just be, because I think of the sort of hybridity of it. Um, and because it doesn't really fit into any of those boxes in the first place. But yeah, this is not, this is not sort of a, well, this just solves all of our problems going forward. There's a lot more to think about. So thank you. We, uh, we have built up a queue, it looks like, uh, Professor Ford. So we will, I'll next recognize Professor Westbrook, who has his hand raised. Oh, thank you. Um, Really like this paper. I think you've identified uh, the central problem from a legal perspective very well and very helpfully. Um, that is, we got to figure out what what analogy to all the various kinds of entities that we have in our society makes the most sense, and and get the post office into that type of entity. It occurs to me that at least a lot of people would think that the model here should be a regulated utility, right? Uh, we in Texas have had a lot of experience lately with various levels of regulation, various attempts to introduce the benefits of competition without losing the notion of what? Universal service. Uh, I can tell you that about three weeks ago, as I was sitting in my bed under about 12 blankets, I thought you, you know, universal service sounded like a really good idea. So it seems to me that, that a model might be make this a private company, but a private company subject to regulation. What we normally do is say, well, then the, the rate payers have got to pay more if it's necessary to keep the company viable financially. Um, but on the other hand, because of social imperatives, there's a lot of claim to universal service, which by the way, might, as we've seen with schools and so forth, might include electronic services as well. It's not obvious that utilities of this sort should be limited to delivering things with stamps on them. Um, but it seems to me that model may make more sense. It then puts on the table for Congress, okay, if you don't want to charge a dollar and a half a letter <laughs> uh, for first class mail, then you're going to have to subsidize first class mail on the one hand. And on the other hand, if what you're concerned about is everybody being able to deliver these, this bundle of flyers that I get in my mailbox, which increasingly seems to be what the U.S. Postal Service does is deliver those flyers to me and, and catalogs and that sort of thing. Um, if that is something that ought to be subsidized, then Congress can address that. So it seems to me a regulatory model may make some sense here. And of course, we know bankruptcy can be useful for, re for uh, regulated institutions. Competition can be useful, but as Texas has recently demonstrated, that's a very tricky business, both those things. Uh, so it seems to me we might want to start with simply a regulated utility and then think about building on from there. <clears throat> anyway, very helpful paper, and uh, I hope you pursue it. Well, thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. And I, I you know, I've, I've had um, the regulated utility kind of in the back of my head, I think the whole time um, I've been writing this paper and I've been thinking about sort of the similarities there. And so I think you know, there, you're right that there's still a, like there's still a lot to sort through. I think no matter how you put it, you know, um, but um, I also think that the status quo, right, is just so 
it's so not tenable. And there's also just such a, a, a sort of lack of thought about the overall structure. That's what it seems to me to be sort of the most glaring with all of this is just as we've gone through this, there's just really been a lack of thought as to what exactly this is. So much so that it has to be litigated at the Supreme Court level. Um, and so much so that, you know, we, if you look just a cursory glance on the internet, you know, there's a there's debate about what it is. Um, and so I definitely think um, there is precedent for something like, as you, as you said, sort of a regulatory model. And so I will definitely continue to think about that going forward. Thank you. And, and I think that one of the things that your, your point about clarity is so important is that it puts it on the table with Congress, put up or shut up uh, with respect to universal service. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. We do that with other kinds of entities for specific purposes. And I think your argument in favor of clarity is, uh, is really essential to that result. Politically, here it is. Where are you going to go with it? Are the taxpayers going to pony up for this or not? Anyway, good paper. Thanks. Thank you. Next, recognizing Professor Linnell. Right. Um, thanks so much. And thank you, Laura, for this also fantastic paper. So Jay skipped one of my question comments, which was also, it sounds to me like a regulated utility. So I'd, um, so I'd add that and maybe encourage you if you're going in that direction to look at some of the work that's done in admin and admin adjacent uh, research areas by, for example, Sabil Rahman and Morgan Ricks, who are thinking kind of seriously about interlocking structures of a, a broader conception of what infrastructure means in the contemporary era. Um, so I feel like some of that might resonate with some of the things that you're thinking about and might be useful for you to take a look at. Um, so that was sort of my one question comment. And then the other one was a, a bit more of a, maybe sort of a more political science question. I wonder if you could provide a little bit more insight into the mapping of the interest groups that might be in favor or against certain characterizations of USPS. Um, it seems like that would be helpful in thinking about some of this, right? Because the map doesn't seem to, to, to fit the traditional geography of who would be pro and against a characterization of the USPS as a government agency, right? Because it seems like for some of the entities or the people, the communities that would say, usually, you know, get the government out of my postal service. And then you say, well, the government's out of your postal service and therefore you're getting no post. Uh, you know, maybe that shifts things. And it would be interesting to me to know a little bit more if you know, or if studies have been done, because this is an area that's totally far away from my own work, um, what that map of interest groups actually looks like going toward you know, if we're gonna clarify in one way or another, if one form of clarity or one mechanism of clarifying actually ends up being more politically feasible, maybe we head in that direction. That's a great question. And I think one of the one of the difficulties, and I I I'm not sure, I know there's been a little bit of work on this because actually in the GAO report, one of the things they discussed was that there's there's a lot of um, you know, the various stakeholders or the those that you know have a, I guess, have a stake in the USPS's future, um, not only seem to uh, not only disagree, of course, about the future, but also tend to shift, I think, their perspective depending on what's at stake. Um, and so sort of like what you were saying, I think there's um, there are folks out there that are very much like, yeah, get the government out of my postal service. And then, but then they don't want the effects of that, which which potentially are not mailed, you know, not having mail delivery. Um, there are, um, you know, I think a lot of the, a lot of the unions are very much seem to be very much in favor of classifying it as a government agency. There's a lot of hesitancy to make it something like a private business because they feel like they want the government protections. Um, at the same time, it does seem like um, it seems like the that you know everybody wants the classification that gets them what they want when they want it. And they're okay with that classification changing, um, you know, or, or sort of the USPS being characterized differently depending on the setting. So for example, in like the antitrust context, it was very important for the USPS to be seen as a government agency, as somebody that couldn't be challenged um, uh, under the antitrust laws. And so, I think what's tricky about it, and I, I will look into this more because I think you're right that, you know, but I think what's tricky about it from like a political perspective is that even the stakeholders, many of them are not sure of the classification that they want, <laughs> um, or they want one classification for one purpose and another for a different purpose. And so they kind of 
we end up with this really hybrid system or entity because everybody wants it to work for their own purposes. But thank you. And I will look into that and I'll look at the uh, admin stuff as well. That's great. Next, recognizing Professor uh, Pardo. Um, thanks so much, uh, Laura, for being part of our program and for this great uh, paper. Uh, so I have um, two uh, comments uh, may, or a question and a comment. Maybe the first thing is also a question. But um, so, you know, I was really interested uh, in thinking about the political story here about uh, you mentioned that in the 1840s, the USPS was given the monopoly over letter carrying. Um, and I'm not quite sure when in the 1840s that happened, but um, of course, the, the first half of the 1840s, if not more, uh, the Whigs were very much involved in building a robust activist federal state um, and nation building focused on commercial activity. Um, and coincidentally, the Bankruptcy Act of 1841 was uh, during this time. So, you know, you ended your presentation by saying, well, you know, what is it? What is the UP, USPS? What do we want it to be? And I just wonder if there's something to be uh, gained, uh, some sort of payoff from thinking back to that historical uh, uh, arc of the USPS, thinking back to the 1840s um, and this sort of robust activist federal estate, and whether that maybe points us in taking it back to those roots or, or, or not. Um, so I, just kind of some musings on the history, but I, I think the history is very interesting. And then I was just also wondering whether there might be any useful lessons or parallels from the financial difficulties Amtrak has had. So, you know, there's there's been a lot of litigation status of Amtrak, right? We've got those series of uh, decisions as, you know, whether it's uh, the LeBron decision in 1995 or the follow-up 2015 decision saying, well, it's a federal instrumentality for at least constitutional purposes, but maybe not a government owned or corporation, and whether there are any helpful parallels uh, from the Amtrak setting, especially given the financial difficulties it's had. Yeah, thank you for both of those. I do think the historical arc of the USPS is really, um, really important and or can be really important in thinking about, you know, what we want the USPS to be going forward. One of the things that that really struck me is that, you know, back back in the day or for many years right from the from before the founding of the country through really the 1900s mid 1900s um there was just this sort of um you know i think acceptance or you know comfort with like the usps is a part of the government it's an important part of the government and even today um in polls uh you know the usps consistently ranks as like everybody's favorite government agency <laughs> and so it's like it's this weird part of the government that everybody likes um, but but i think that you know to the extent that to the extent that we 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 want we care about sort of what the original vision for the post office was or is you know it it, it i think undoubtedly was meant to serve this very public facing purpose and so i think that you know looking to history and seeing how we you know how we have sort of tried to retain that public facing purpose while at the same time making these making these changes that we think are going to improve the post office you know maybe with maybe it's time to sit back and assess are the changes that we have made really improving the post office and allowing it to fulfill that public mission and i think that's what what many folks continue to come back to that sort of look at this is just that you know how important is this public public facing mission in today's world? How important is it? Um, and, and to what extent can that mission be broadened? You know, maybe we don't want to get the junk mail that we get every week in our mailboxes, but maybe there are other services that the USPS provides, particularly in a rural setting that are valuable, like checking up on people that don't, you know, interact with other people very often, um, delivering medicine and that sort of thing. Um, I've looked briefly at Amtrak because uh, I, I, I think I, my initial thought too was like maybe that's a good parallel, um, and I think it's it's it is um, it it provides some really interesting. Um, <laughs> like I, it's an interesting point of comparison. One of the things that I think is is particularly interesting is you know Amtrak is basically seeking a bailout or has been trying to seek a bailout for a number of years now it seems, um, and and so you know. It, that provides, I think, some 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 thought too. Is if we think that the USPS is like Amtrak, you know, maybe it, 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 then maybe maybe that's um, you know uh, maybe that's something to consider as well. 
Um, so I haven't done a ton of comparison there, but I did look into it very early on. Um, and I think, uh, I think there might be some good, um, good comparisons to draw because of course, train ridership is also suffering these days, um, not just the mail, but thank you. I will look into that. Next, recognizing Professor Elias. Great. Um, so thank you, um, Laura. I thought this was really a wonderful project, and I learned a lot about how the post office worked, which was not ex what I was expecting to do um, when I was invited to the symposium. So I thought it was wonderful. Um, I want to echo a point that Jay made and sort of preview where George and I are going with the talk that we'll give after lunch, which is I wonder if bankruptcy is actually more useful here um, than the NBC suggested. Um, and the reason for that is because we've recently seen examples of sort of companies that are in, you know, I guess also cities like the city of Detroit or the city of Stockton that are able to take advantage of the crisis atmosphere that bankruptcy creates and the access to, you know, not just bankruptcy law, which wasn't very useful in any of those cases or in the pg e case that I'll talk about soon because of political constraints or, you know, legal constraints or other things, but also just to get access to, um, you know, the bankruptcy bargaining apparatus where you get lawyers, you get um, all these other things. And that in like, you know, in the city of Detroit case that was able to help help break through, um, you know, bargaining gridlock and facilitate a political compromise that could have been done outside of bankruptcy, but you needed the crisis atmosphere of bankruptcy to get people to where they should have been. And this case reminds me a lot of that, where you have these deeply entrenched political interests, no incentives for anybody to want to compromise. And maybe it is good to say, shoot, you know, leaders of the bargaining local, um, you know, you, you're, you're going to take a contract to your to your members that they're going to absolutely hate, but the fact that you're in bankruptcy means that maybe there's a better track record of getting some level of compromise and buy-in from everybody. Um, so, you know, I, like when I first read this, I thought, of course, this isn't a bankruptcy problem. It's a crisis of governance problem. But what George and I are going to talk about is, you know, progressively more of our crises of governance are getting filtered into the bankruptcy system. And maybe there's something to that. And you can accomplish things that, you know, would have been harder to do outside of bankruptcy. Um, anyway, this is really interesting and I'm excited to see where you go with it. Thanks, Jared. And I'm really uh, uh, excited about your paper um, as well. And I, um, yeah, I think it's a good point. I think part of what I'm stumbling with is like just the statutory, you know, framework, the statutory constraints, I think. But I think if we move the USPS maybe towards a regulatory model, uh, we just get it a little bit further away from sort of the the, 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 I guess, tightly yoked government position that it's in, there's actually a lot more work that bankruptcy can do. And so I think that that's something that, um, yeah, that maybe I'll explore in a little bit more depth too as I, as I work on the next iteration of this paper. Um, because I think, I, I agree. And we, we, we ask bankruptcy, you know, in essence, functionally to take on so much these days beyond just sort of the, 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 the law as it is on the code and as it is in the in the code. And so I think that's a really um, a really interesting thought and a good direction. So thank you. Professor Cords, um, obviously we are we're getting ready to bump up against um, the next presentation time, but there is one comment in the QA um, which which reads, if revenues are less than expenses, restructuring is not going to be useful. Um, making I guess a, a greater point about <laughs> what, what is the use of bankruptcy in the context of the Postal Service if it's impossible for it to return to profitability? Um, I'll give you a chance if you'd like to respond to that um, or reference back to, to some other part of your uh, paper presentation if you'd like quickly. Yeah, so um, really quickly being cognizant of the time. Um, thank you for that. And I, 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 I agree, right? Um, it's not going to transform um, expenses into revenues <laughs> for sure. And so I think part of this, I, I do think part of this again is, you know, getting it to a place where it can return to profitability, getting it to a place where it maybe can respond and can innovate in response to the, um, the challenges that it is facing. Um, and so that would involve, I think, an organizational restructuring, not a bankruptcy restructuring first off to get it to that place. Um, and that's a place where potentially bankruptcy can do more good if we get it to a place where it can actually function the way um, or closer to the way that it is supposed to. Okay, thank you, Professor Cords. Um, we, we do have someone who raised their hand as an attendee, but I will regretfully have to ask they lower their hand as we are bumping against that um, 11 a.m. 
timeline. Um, with that in mind, um, we'll now invite Professor Lanau to present on disaggregated sovereign bankruptcy. All right. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you, Matthew and Vera, for inviting me to join uh, the symposium. And thanks to everyone who's watching now and who might be watching at some point in the future or recording um, for joining as well. So I'm also going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Is that working? Bonus cute kid shot. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Everyone can see that, I'm assuming? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so thanks again for, for inviting me to join. So my work kind of spans debt accreditor issues, um, uh, international law, international relations, international legal theory. I'm also interested in sort of the historical development of the international financial system. And what uh, Matthew and Vera asked me to speak about today, and what my essay is on, is uh, one of the kind of more prosaic elements of my broader research agenda, sort of thinking about contemporary problems um, and you know, solutions and how to think about them. Um, so I'm assuming that this is a more kind of domestic bankruptcy oriented audience here um, with a somewhat less familiarity with international finance and international debt accreditor relations. So I'm gonna provide some background on that and, um, and hope that that's helpful to everyone. So. Um, so the issues that I'm hoping to talk about first, what has been and could be the financial impact on, of the pandemic for countries um, in particular. So when I'm thinking about sovereign bankruptcy and sovereign debt issues, I'm talking about um, country sovereigns as opposed to state sovereigns, which are as sometimes discussed in the municipal bankruptcy uh, situations. Um, so first, what has been the, and what could be the financial impact for countries? What have been the efforts so far, uh, both at the national level and also at the international level, and how do those interact? Um, what are some of the short and medium term proposals to deal with the likely financial fallout of COVID-19? Um, and what more could be done on a sort of a more long term basis? Um, so first, what has been the nature of the impact so far? So some of you, probably many of you have followed um, maybe the international news on some of this. So for many countries, this has been an incredibly difficult time because of the decreased revenue um, and decreased foreign exchange that they've been able to access. This has been especially difficult because many countries, not the US, uh, but many countries have a large portion of their debt, especially their foreign debt, uh, their debt owed to foreign creditors denominated not in their own currency. Um, and so this has been a, a special problem. So some of the reasons for that are um, drops in commodity prices to the extent that they are dependent on these commodities for getting foreign exchange. Um, obviously, the general drop in trade, um, the drop in tourism for some range of countries, especially developing and lower income countries, tourism dollars or tourism uh, other currencies are very important. And also some range of countries um, depend heavily or some portions of their communities depend heavily on remittances. So uh, these are funds sent by people who are based in those countries, in those debtor countries, uh, but that are working in remittance host countries, including the US and um, whose labor has been uh, no longer needed given the drop in economic activity generally. So those remittance flows have dropped as well. So for all of these reasons, this decreased revenue and decreased foreign exchange has been a real problem. Simultaneously, you've had the increase in government expenditures in many countries, as we know perfectly well um, from some of the discussions in Congress this week, right? And this has been common across countries. Uh, some countries have had to deal significantly with unemployment, either direct, directly or indirectly to the extent that it's caused sort of social dislocation. Um, some countries have put a fair amount of additional money into healthcare. Um, for some countries, even basic kind of security needs have not been attended to, especially countries that have depended significantly on external trade um, for key commodities, including food commodities. There have been uh, food security issues in some range of countries that they've had to uh, deal with, struggle with, uh, or pay a lot more for. Um, of course, the impact of all of this has been uneven globally, right? Um, different countries have different starting points in terms of how they're doing economically and also different starting points in how they're doing on the debt front. Um, you know, there was a debt crisis brewing even prior to COVID-19. Um, and so that's sort of 
shifted the, the starting point for a number of countries. Um, some countries have tended to be more reliant on international transactions, just as sort of a general baseline. Uh, different countries obviously have different healthcare capacities um, to sort of deal with the problems that have been added to them. Um, and of course, different countries have different borrowing costs. So the extent that they are turning to borrowing to help fund this shortfall, uh, the cost of that borrowing uh, differs significantly as well. Um, at the human level, the World Bank and the IMF have estimated that the risk of extreme poverty, um, the additional risk of extreme poverty resulting from the pandemic and the follow on sort of financial and economic uh, crises recessions, uh, recessions is about 150 million people. So that's not the 150 million people um, at risk as a baseline. These are 150 million people in the world additionally at risk um, of extreme poverty. So a uh, very significant difficult economic and financial impacts, as well as, of course, the underlying public health um, impact and, and crisis. So here are some visuals for you. Maybe some of you have seen these. Uh, Koh Samui, Thailand, Venice, Italy, usually completely swarming with people. Um, these are pictures from last year, but and so, so there's been some degree of uptick, but um, completely deserted in a very uncharacteristic way. So, you have the layer of problems that are particular to the crisis, right, to the pandemic and COVID-19. Um, that is layered on top of a not really great starting point for the financial architecture in terms of dealing with these types of problems, right? So the background problems um, that those COVID-19 specific problems are layered onto uh, are also very difficult. So um, for one, over the last decade or so, there's been increased creditor fragmentation. Um, so in certain parts of sovereign debt and sovereign borrowing history, creditors have tended to be um, you know, concentrated in certain creditor types. So sometimes it's uh, bank creditors, um, sometimes it's largely bondholders. Although there are significant collective action problems in terms of dealing with debt situations and debt restructuring situations, um, always, to the extent that creditors are of, generally speaking, a unified type, those collective action problems tend to be lower. Uh, this is no longer the case. So in the last decade or so, you've seen a fragmentation in terms of creditor form. So um, we've had since basically um, the uh, Brady bonds in the 1990s, a focus uh, in sovereign lending, in, in sovereign bonds, in sort of bond and interest. Um, however, that has shifted. So increasingly, we're seeing bonds, but also bank loans. Um, we're seeing commodity-backed loans. Uh, we're seeing um, loans from sort of separate types of state-affiliated or state-owned entities, um, and also an increased amount of collateralization um, in, in sovereign lending as well, in a way that hadn't in the decades previous to this been as common. Um, so we have this creditor fragmentation making any collective efforts more difficult to achieve even than the normal. Um, so in addition, we have the sort of general problem of too little and too late restructurings, right? Um, from both the creditor side and also the sovereign debtor side, there are incentives to delay, um, to, to deny that this is really uh, going to be a serious restructuring situation, to suggest and pray and so on and so forth that this is merely a temporarily a temporary liquidity problem, and this is going to go away shortly. Um, oftentimes, that's not the case, but that is uh, one of the ways of thinking that cause some of these restrictions to be more delayed than ideally they would be. Um, once there is a decision that some kind of a restructuring, some kind of action needs to be taken, oftentimes the action is insufficient to actually put the country back on uh, the way to sustainability. Uh, the officials in charge of countries would try to avoid uh, as much austerity, avoid uh, you know, the types of haircuts. Uh, obviously, the creditors are not especially interested in uh, really deep haircuts. Um, and the IMF, which is oftentimes in the background for these types of things, um, you know, sometimes is maybe not as focused on long run sustainability or on particular definitions of sustainability that include, uh, you know, attention to uh, minimizing the impacts of austerity on the most vulnerable populations that can sometimes cause um, social strife down the line. Um, of course, countries are also very concerned about their reputation, their future access to credit. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the inequities involved in infrequently in, in sovereign debt restructuring can result not just in the sort of the uh, problems, the inherent problems in the inequity, but also in social dislocation and political dislocation um, to the extent that that's not attended to. Um, 
There have been innovations that many of you have no doubt heard about, um, collective action clauses and aggregated collective action clauses um, in sovereign bond um, contracts, especially post 2003 or so, that's been increasingly common. Uh, post 2014, you've had aggregated collective action clauses where uh, particular clauses are put into the debt contracts such that a supermajority of creditors in that, uh, in that debt series or to the extent it's aggregated across a number of debt series can vote in favor of restructuring that then binds all other uh, creditors in a way to try to deal with the uh, the collective action problems that are present. Of course, those are only in bonds. And as I mentioned with the creditor fragmentation point, um, that's not necessarily going to be the case always going forward. Um, there's a huge amount of global debt stock outstanding that does not include these relatively recent innovations. Um, of course, these are contractual innovations. And so future contracts don't necessarily include them. Um, last summer, in one of the more recent rounds of Argentina's debt restructuring negotiations that have lasted roughly the last 20 years on and off, um, the creditor committee suggested that maybe in a future duration they should take out the aggregated collective action clauses that had been included previously, right? Um, which sort of shocked everyone because seem, people seem to have forgotten that contracts can be written and what is considered progress in one contract series is not necessarily present, especially in the absence of any kind of background statutory default to kind of press contracts in a particular direction. Uh, there have been some efforts of domestic legislation to deal with some of these problems um, in the UK, in Belgium in particular, um, and there's some efforts afoot in you know, New York State with some of the civil society groups sort of thinking about how to introduce this in the New York legislature, uh, but that hasn't moved very far. Um, and of course, there are continued problems with transparency. So this is all assuming we actually know how much debt various countries owe, and that is not an assumption that we can necessarily fairly make. Um, this is something that's been raised by a number of entities, including the IMF, including the IIF, the Institute for International Finance, which is sort of the industry group representing uh, creditors and uh, financial institutions involved, private financial institutions and entities involved in international lending. Um, and so there, there's efforts to improve the transparency of sovereign debt, but I'll talk about that later. That hasn't worked out very well. And so you have situations that maybe some of you followed, like, um, you know, the Mozambique debt crisis from the last five-ish or so years, where um, it came to light that certain elements of the central government in Mozambique and the IMF did not realize that uh, some portions of the government had actually entered into significant um, borrowing that, that had a, a, a real impact on uh, Mozambique's capacity to um, uh, to service this external debt. So you have these strange transparency issues where sometimes you don't even actually know what is uh, the sovereign debt problem because we sort of lack that. So um, occasionally here, well, we're in a national recovery and it's all gonna be fine and everyone's gonna be vaccinated and we'll all bounce back and it's, it's all gonna be good, right? Um, Recovery is going to take a while and is going to be uneven, and I don't think anyone can bet on <laughs> can bet on that. Um, in addition, the last year has involved significant changes in the global economy. Um, you know, certain industries have suffered significant blows that they might not be able to recover from. Um, there have been changes in the work patterns. It's sort of still, you know, the jury's out in terms of what the long-term impact is going to be. Um, in addition, understand understandably enough, in trying to deal with the um, the expenditures, the increased expenditures, a number of countries have engaged in significant borrowing. Um, so maybe there's been overborrowing, but at least there's been significant borrowing. Um, in particular, given the increased liquidity, the very low interest rates. Um, this is the case in public sectors in many countries in the world, both the sort of the central governments, but also government and government affiliated entities and also the private sectors. Now, of course, that private sector debt does not necessarily translate immediately into a sovereign balance sheet. However, in many countries, uh, once you, if you know, some years down the line, it turns out that there was significant private sector over borrowing, 
and you have a financial sector, a major industrial structure or, or major infrastructure uh, related sectors that seem to be crashing under private debt, uh, countries will sometimes take that over so that indirectly ends up on the sovereign balance sheet as well. So um, you have the possibility of long run high debt levels um, in a way that we might not see the full long term impact of the COVID-19 crisis and the financial and economic uh, problems that resulted from it until some years down the line when that debt starts coming due, right? So the concentric circles, the ripples are probably going to continue out for some time. Um, we have, and I don't, I think this is a number from last fall, I'm sure it's heading now towards 9 trillion of uh, emerging market developing country foreign currency debt um, that's out there. So a significant potential problem out there. Um, so what has been done? Um, so at the national level, I mentioned the sort of uh, countercyclical efforts across a range of countries. Um, in part, that has relied on borrowing. Um, as part of that, there have been corruption concerns with increased sort of money slushing around in various emergency funds. That can be very tempting uh, for some people. At the international level, the main effort that has been made is the G20's debt suspension. A debt service suspension initiative. This was announced in April 2020 um, by the G20. And this is, of course, a temporary, right? So this is debt service suspension. This is not debt cancellation at all. So um, they don't have to make the debt payments right now, but they're going to have to make them eventually, and they're going to have to pay interest on the delay, right? And there's been, at least for some sort, some portion of the time, an assumption of liquidity rather than insolvency problems. Um, and again, more debt rather than cancellation. Um, and that basically only accounted for less than 4% of developing country payments in 2020. So not quite up to the likely scale of the crisis. Um, that, that initiative didn't mandate any private creditor participation whatsoever. Um, the, the IIF, which I mentioned, the Institute for International Finance, said that uh, maybe, this is last May, they would be interested in participating, but only if any participation was purely voluntary, net present value neutral, and also bespoke, right? Um, and so this has uh, led to seemingly some pre writing problems. So any debt cancellation or debt suspension that was offered to these countries um, was helping to fund these payments to private creditors. Um, this was maybe easier to handle when the members of largely the Paris Club uh, were kind of Western North, you know, global North countries and the private creditors that were getting the sort of benefit of this were also based in those locations. So it's in some ways a weird subsidization of some of the investment and financing groups in your own countries. Um, now that that geography has broken down with the rise of traditional southern countries as major creditors, um, that that doesn't work as well in some ways, right? Um, in addition, there's sort of unevenness as to who counts as an official creditor, especially given the rise of a range of hybrid kind of public-private creditors in a number of countries that have been very involved in sovereign lending. Um, in November 2020, the G20 announced an update. Um, this is the DSSI common framework. Um, this update is supposed to allow for restructuring, so not just debt suspension, but possible restructuring. Um, however, and this little writing is uh, uh, covering my, <laughs> my um, there it is. Um, so restructuring is possible there. And in addition, the common framework does expect private creditor participation through the comparability of treatment principle. So this is a sort of a standard principle in uh, Paris Club uh, official creditor countries, whereby if you, if you set up a framework that allows for restructuring, the countries are supposed to go to their private creditors and say, look, the official creditors are getting, uh, are canceling some portion of our debt or restructuring some portion of our debt, but we need to ask the same of you. Um, however, exceptions are possible. So it's really unclear exactly how, um, how effective that's going to be or what exceptions are going to be granted. Um, and in addition, the private creditors and the credit rating agencies have, um, have basically said that anyone who asks for any restructuring under this framework is going to risk their access to future uh, private capital. Um, so only I think three countries have raised the possibility of this. Ethiopia is currently in discussions, and I think Zambia and Chad um, looked into this or asked about this in January. Um, upon their request for this, the credit rating agencies um, uh, downgraded their, their credit ratings, um, which raises the concern that they're going to have this 
creditworthiness hit, and then the actual extent of the relief ends up being very, very uncertain. Um, so, um, you know, it's possibly better than nothing, but not really as much as one could want. Um, additional proposals that have been out there floated by various people, including sort of scholars and policymakers, um, extend the DSSI and the common framework. Um, currently, it's supposed to expire in uh, on July 1st, I think. It's running through the end of June. Um, we anticipate, or everyone is anticipating, that in April during the G20 meetings, the IMF World Bank meetings, um, this is going to be extended past July 1st. So that's, you know, better than not extending it. Um, you might have been reading about uh, a new allocation of IMF special drawing rights. So basically the IMF equivalent of um, liquidity injections and printing currency, um, quite currency, but something akin to that. Um, and this would make um, these allocations available to IMF members. Um, it's not an ideal fix because IMF SDR allocations are allocated according to uh, member country uh, yeah, membership in the IMF and voting shares in the IMF. And of course, those countries that are least likely to need these SDRs are the ones that are going to be allocated the largest amount uh, of the allocation. And so the IMF, I think, is currently working on a proposal that hopefully is going to deal with some of that imbalance. Um, another uh, possibility that has been raised is a new central credit facility um, that could potentially be funded by an IMF SDR. So that's one of the things that's out there. Um, possibility of debt buybacks, um, you know, in particular, if the the sovereign bonds if the debt is trading um, at a low price on the secondary market. So debt buybacks could be one way to retire those. And so possibly even setting up a facility to allow countries to work on these debt buybacks as a way to sort of limit their, um, their, um, their long-term debt exposure. Um, you know, earlier on in the crisis, there was more discussion about, well, maybe what we need to do is some kind of coordinated domestic emergency legislation right, to immediately make a range of this debt completely not uh, recoverable in various courts, right? So that was one possibility that was out there. It's still floating around. Um, and also earlier on in the crisis, there, so there was the possibility of UN Security Council action, right? So um, this is not very frequently used, but uh, after the US invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the subsequent sort of debt restructurings around then, and the risk that private creditors were gonna try to seize um, assets of Iraq, the UN Security Council put in place um, an action that basically froze all of those efforts. So that would be another kind of emergency type effort that's out there. Uh, I don't think I have to tell anyone that that was a very unusual geostrategic moment uh, in which countries that usually are not interested in interfering with debt collection, in particular the US, suddenly became very interested in freezing that type of thing. Um, and so it's not clear exactly if you're gonna have that confluence of circumstances uh, again, but that is another possibility that has been raised that is out there. Um, some longer term proposals um, that are out there as well. Uh, well, maybe we can improve the contracts um, that are governing sovereign debt. So we have cross debt aggregated collective action clauses. So not just in bonds, but maybe we include it in uh, bank, bank syndicated loans to the extent that that's becoming more present as well. And so there are a number of people, including some attorneys, um, that are working on that. Uh, maybe we index the bonds. This is, of course, uh, something that's becoming more common. Index the bonds to um, uh, you know, key commodity prices or GDP or something like that. In some ways, commodity-based pricing is a little bit, uh, indexing is a little easier just because that's easier to track as opposed to GDP, which can be played with a little bit. Um, also, cocoa bonds, contingent convertible bonds, right? So in the event that some emergency happens and some of the discussion here has been, uh, you know, could be, it has been sort of climate change related. So hurricane bonds, right? So in the event that some major natural uh, disaster happens that the bonds immediately, the payments get suspended. Um, and, you know, if in the event of some other thing happens, then immediately everyone is invited to restructuring or something like that. Um, so, you know, you could write those however you want. So that these are some of the things that are under, under discussion, which I think are a great idea. Um, again, coordinated domestic legislation. Maybe we try to put this in place in the few, for the future, right? Um, so there's not this scrambling and emergency legislation that's happening, uh, you, know, I, you know, later than ideally it should be. Um, some people have said, well, maybe we go back to a full-scale global debt restructuring mechanism along the lines of the IMF 
uh, proposal in the early 2000s for a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, the, M the SDRM. Um, but it's not clear that there is a lot of energy for that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm recommending that I don't think we can do that latter point, the full-scale SDRM, um, but nonetheless, it would be helpful to have some commitment to disaggregated sovereign bankruptcy or what I'm calling disaggregated sovereign bankruptcy. I think the time has come uh, for us to think about really what that would mean and maybe some kind of global debt authority or coordinating mechanism. So uh, what do I mean by disaggregated sovereign bankruptcy? What's the sovereign bankruptcy part? What's the disaggregation part? So, um, you know, there have, it's, it's really not reinventing the wheel here. There's no need to do that. There is a shared set of principles, right? Um, and commitments and ideas that are out there that are seeking to make the international debt arena a little bit closer to um, kind of domestic bankruptcy arenas in terms of comprehensive and collective participation, attempts to deal with um, these sort of collective action and hold out problems, um, to think more seriously about sustainable outcomes, right? You wouldn't approve a restructuring plan, um, you know, in the absence of thinking that it's actually going to work, right? Uh, all of this kind of stuff, but a more explicit commitment to this and also more explicit commitment to ideas of transparency, impartiality, um, and legitimacy, whatever that would mean in the, in the uh, debt restructuring context. And I've, I've written about that as well. Um, how would we do this? Well, a centralized mechanism like the IMF SDRM is, is at this point politically hard and perhaps actually no longer appropriate given the fragmentation that we have seen in the creditor um, arena. So that earlier recommendation SDRM really was supposed to be dealing with bonds. Um, given that some portion of the sovereign lending has moved away from that, maybe that's actually no longer quite right. Um, we need simultaneous work done on all of these tracks, on markets and contracts, on domestic legislation, on international guidelines um, and soft law. And I think we need to start thinking about these tracks as complementary instead of competitive. Sometimes you'll hear that, well, you know, we're not gonna work on domestic legislation stuff or we're not gonna work on international kind of guideline type stuff because really the work needs to be done through markets and contracts. And I think that that is a misunderstanding of the dynamics um, in the area. And I think, you know, the key and obvious example here is that early 2000s moment where things like collective action clauses had been very common in the UK law world in the sovereign debt governed by UK law, but had not been adopted in sovereign debt governed by New York law. And at the time, it seems that a number of the market participants in the New York context said that, no, we can't possibly incorporate this kind of collective action mechanism into our bonds because it would undermine uh, the markets, it would undermine uh, you know, lending, it would make lending more expensive, and you know, we just have to continue on as we are. Um, as soon as the IMF, or pretty soon after the IMF suggested, okay, well, forget that then, how about we go with a more statutory approach um, that's a little bit more muscular, um, the market participants then were all of a sudden much more um, enamored with the idea of collection, collective action clauses in, in bonds uh, and working on improving the market mechanism. So I think you have this dynamic where pushes from one track actually will help improvements in another track. Um, so I think that we need to sort of explicitly say we're working on all of this all at once, um, animated by a, a shared set of principles, um, even if they're disaggregated in terms of the mechanism, in terms of the location, in terms of the timing. Um, that said, um, some coordination would be good if we are actually going to be adopting this kind of disaggregated approach or embracing a disaggregated approach as not just sort of random things happening all at once, but still working under a shared set of principles. Um, would be good to have some kind of coordinating mechanism um, and also what I called a landing pad for homeless proposals and orphan initiatives. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is so common and that we've seen in the last year is that in the moment of crisis, right? Um, actually, this is a bit what uh, Jared was talking about in the questions for Laura's paper. Um, in the moment of crisis, there's a ton of energy, right? There are many, many proposals. There are lots of different ideas. Um, and you could organize them into buckets, right? There's the domestic legislation proposals. There's the market proposals. There's the emergency UN-based legislation proposals. Um, there's a lot of energy and a lot of thinking. And then when the crisis seems to be 
the easing down, they all get shelved basically on SSRN, right? Um, and so it would be good to have a way to continue work on each of these buckets so that you have proposals ready to go for the next crisis. Currently, no one is doing that. The IMF sort of does that, but not really. Um, you know, there's other kind of homeless and orphaned initiatives. Uh, I mentioned debt transparency earlier and the importance of sovereign debt transparency, because otherwise, how are you going to know what the crisis is if you actually don't know what the debt is? Um, one of the things that has been very puzzling is that uh, everyone agrees that we need a sovereign debt registry to improve transparency in this area. No one seems to know exactly where it should go. Um, the IMF has inexplicably said that they're not interested. Um, the Institute for International Finance has said, well, maybe we're happy to coordinate this, but they're, of course, the main lobbying body for um, you know, private finance, and so that's not ideal. Um, I've had some people call me to see if Cornell Law School would like to host such a thing, which is ludicrous because an academic institution should not be hosting such a thing. Um, currently, the European and Mediterranean Economists Association have, have tried to put together just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, a debt transparency platform. Um, so that's one possibility that's out there, but not really ideal given the sort of uh, geographically constricted nature of that, uh, of that grouping. So you need I mean, I think we need some kind of mechanism, some kind of home for these types of things. Um, as part of that, I think a coordinating global mechanism could construct and cultivate at actor networks. So to some degree, this already exists in various academic conferences, but a more regular kind of interaction geared towards improving and refining the pro proposals in those various buckets, I think could be helpful. Um, some logistical niceties for this type of uh, thing. Um, it would be nice to have a global debt authority, some kind of international authority. Um, ideally, you'd eventually get universal membership, but it's not essential that it have universal membership initially. So one possibility or one possible model is the, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, so now it's the sort of major, nice international uh, organization with lovely headquarters in Vienna, but it actually started not as a multilateral organization. It was a mini lateral organization with just a smaller number of interested um, countries and uh, committed sort of civil society entities and started off, I believe, in a hotel uh, or hotel room, series of hotel rooms in Vienna, right? Um, so the idea of thinking small, um, but, but then thinking long run, right, um, I think is, is maybe a way to think about this. And I should also uh, acknowledge that I have worked, done some work with UNCTAD on trying to put together a proposal along these lines. Um, some of you might be familiar with UNCTAD, but this is a, a UN organization set up in the 1970s as part of the new international economic order to give more of a voice to developing countries. Um, that still continues to be the case, but as a result, uh, there's some range of the international financial community that studiously avoid listening to what they have to say. Um, so, you know, there's challenges associated with that, but nonetheless, that's, um, that's, that's out there too. So um, my general thinking here is that we should use this energy not to just deal with the current emergency, but also to put in place an architecture that might help to deal more um, uh, systematically with any future emergencies that come up. So um, I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. And especially if you are more focused on domestic bankruptcy issues, I hope that was helpful. All right, we will now open up the floor for questions from fellow panelists, as well as from attendees, if you'd like to send one in through the Q&A. Hi, Odette, how are you? Um, thank you so much for uh, this great paper um, and just this great project. Um, something uh, that occurred to me was, um, uh, you know, you mentioned this idea of a sovereign debt registry. Um, and so um, that's just an, an idea that's uh, very interesting to me. And, um, you know, here I'm probably going to prove that a, a little bit of knowledge can be really dangerous because I'm not going to know what I'm talking about. But um, I, I seem to recall that, right, that the, there's the Cape Town Convention on Aircraft Equipment for international interest on aircraft equipment. And, and I think that there's a registry based system 
there. And, and I believe it was um, that that uh, convention was passed. Uh, it, uh, it's a UN, um, I think, organized uh, endeavor or treaty. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if that's something that you've come across or thought about and whether that might uh, you know, present a good model for thinking about uh, how we might go about implementing a sovereign debt registry. Yeah, um, absolutely. So yeah, there are a number of kind of international registries. And I think that, yeah, Cape Town Convention and I is, and maybe others know better, but yeah, international interest in, in, in aircraft. And so I think you're right that that is the kind of model where that would be ideal that you'd be thinking of. And, um, and although the initial goal of any potential sovereign debt registry is basically, let's just actually make this more transparent. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes people say, well, transparency, that would be like a nice thing to have on the side. Um, but I do think it's really fundamental to even thinking about the idea of sovereign debt and of talking about country ownership, right? There's a whole lot of discussion in the IMF and the World Bank and the and these private creditors saying, well, the countries need to take ownership for their financial futures. And really, you know, they can't be begging us for, uh, for, you know, haircuts if they can't even keep it together themselves. And then you go and ask the citizens of the country, and they're the ones that are ultimately going to be suffering under any austerity measures and have to pay the debt back. It's like, they have no idea actually what the debt is because neither the officials nor the IMF nor the private creditors so far have been obligated to actually make any of that transparent. So it's like, well, yeah, country ownership, but what the hell are you supposed to be owning? I mean, the idea of owning things that you cannot possibly even know the existence of is just ludicrous. I mean, it would be ludicrous in any other property and debt system of the world, except for this international one, which seems to run by some other set of unspecified rules. When you actually look at the implicit rules, they're ludicrous, really, actually, right? Um, so I'm big on the debt transparency idea to the, I think it's a precursor for any serious claims about country ownership. And especially, I'm also annoyed because sometimes the country ownership claims and arguments are said very smugly. Um, so I think first you want the transparency just because I think it's a precursor for anything else. Um, but I think then you could use it in interesting ways, right? If you actually had a functioning sovereign debt registry, you could, for example, say to the New York legislature and the UK parliament and a number of other you know, legislative entities, how about nothing too radical, right? We're not pushing you to like throw at Elliot yet, though maybe we'd want you to do that. It's one of the major vulture funds uh, involved in, in, in sovereign debt. How about you do something simple like say, if your debt is not placed on this global debt registry, it is not enforceable in New York courts and you cannot claim any assets in the United States. That'd be totally fine, right? That seems like a totally reasonable thing to do. But it would immediately put teeth into the idea of debt transparency without being especially radical. So I think, um, I think thinking of things like you know Cape Town Convention, some of these international conventions, to try to do uh, initially just purely transparency, but then with these follow-on effects for debt collection, um, you know, asset claiming, all of that kind of stuff, right? Along a kind of a secured transactions type idea, is is the way to go to think about it in these steps. Yeah. Uh, up next in the queue, we have Professor Westbrook. Uh, this terrific paper just extends the, the great work you've been doing in this area uh, of debt. And we're all, all of us who are interested in sovereign debt are, are very grateful to you for, for that work. Um, I have 120 questions and comments. Uh, I will try to restrict them a bit uh, or uh, leave room for everybody else. Um, one question I wanna ask you that's just it's outside of your paper, although you mentioned it briefly, and that is, how do you understand the supposedly secured obligation such in the, in the, in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative where China supposedly has a security interest in a harbor for the money that it's advanced for the harbor reconstruction. What does that mean? I mean, I'm a litigator and I think in terms of, of relief, you know, what, what, what can one do about that? Can we send in the gunboats again? Are we gonna go back to the 19th century or what? <laughs> that is such a good question, right? Um, 
So it's pretty clear that you're no longer supposed to send in gunboats. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? But uh, but how, so, I mean, one question is how could China actually enforce something like that, right? Um, exactly. And also how could one get out of it, right? If that were gonna be something that you wanted to do, which some range of countries no doubt want to. Um, in terms of enforcement, so I would be really surprised if at this point they went with gunboats, right? Um, in part because of China and a number of the countries that are involved in some of that real kind of secured obligations, collateralized lending in the sovereign debt space have imperial histories on the other side, right? Uh, yeah, and so that would be a real twist. And uh, basically they're, they're saying, okay, forget it. We're no longer the leader of the, the anti-imperial developing country. So I, I think that that's unlikely to happen. And that would be, it would be a very fair challenge to say, okay, now you fully have gone imperial, right? You're, you're out with the US and the UK these days, right? Um, but the, but China continues to be one of the major lenders to these countries. And so as with so much lending, right, um, whether it is in a domestic corporate context and you're thinking about, you know, the secured party in possession type dip lender going forward or in the sovereign debt context, whoever is willing to lend most and in some ways willing to lend most and ask the fewest questions still has a great amount of power, right? And so I think that, that that's part of what's going on. So even though the the sort of heavy duty gunboat type diplomacy isn't present, the, we, we still have you on the hook. Financial diplomacy is still very much present in particular if um, there are a few other creditors that are willing to lend, right? Um, in that way or in those concessional rates or unfortunately in ways that allow the officials of certain countries to skim off the top and not be too worried about it anymore. I mean, so on the one hand, I'm very much in favor of the World Bank and some of these, these uh, you know, multilateral institutions paying closer attention to corruption issues. On the other hand, to the extent that they're no longer the only players in town, right, that the creditor market itself is more competitive and includes lenders willing to lend without asking all those pesky questions about where the money is going, as long as, they, as, long as they're willing to say, and by the way, you can also have the harbor if it doesn't work out. Um, then, you know, you have this, this dynamic of, um, which you read my paper on this, uh, on the sort of the mismatch between private wealth and corruption flows and sovereign debt flows as sort of leading to misallocations of, of finance in the international arena. So that's, that's a, bad, a bad answer to a good question, but I don't know if there are any good answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great answer to the yeah. question. I'll just mention a couple other comments briefly, not even looking for a response to mm -hmm. leave room for everybody else. But it seems to me that one thing that we're beginning to realize is that bankruptcy teaches us that to reach a debt settlement, you need coercion in the background. You need something that's going to happen if everybody doesn't come to the table and find a way out. Um, and, and that's what has been largely neglected in this conversation. And you've begun to put that on the table. Um, I, I think your ideas about transparency are also important and, uh, and, and need very badly to be done. Thank you. Next up, we have <laughs> Next up, we have a question from Professor Elias. It's so um, thank you, Odette. I thought this was a wonderful project. And like you said, as somebody who is, quote, domestic bankruptcy biased, unquote, um, it's an area that I don't know a ton about. And I really enjoyed getting the chance to learn a little bit more. Um, and this ties into something that I've been thinking about and that Tony has a new paper on, which is sort of where we thought the world was going last this time last year in terms of global debt and where we thought the world and where the world turned out to be. So I, like a lot of others, thought that we were entering a period where we would have a sort of global solvency crisis, especially for corporates, maybe less so for governments because the solvency mechanisms work differently. And that turned out to be less the case than we thought. Um, we thought it was a global solvency crisis for individuals. That's also been less the case than we thought. And some of that's been because of deliberate domestic policy making um, in different you know, across different countries by different national governments. Um, but part of that has been because of the willingness of private actors to continue to fund, um, you know, I guess 
governments and corporates um, really without much discipline whatsoever. And so one of the things I take from your project is that, you know, maybe we mistimed when the solvency crisis is, maybe the solvency crisis comes later. And this ties back in some ways to what Laura was really helpfully talking about with her project, which is thinking about the post office as this government agency that has this set of things it needs to do and has a set of constraints on its ability to do those things. And this debt overhang problem that's pretty vicious and a function of statutory mandates and other things that will keep it from being able to offer offer a huge level of services in the future. So um, I guess my question for you, um, going beyond that long-winded comment, is I wonder if it would be possible um, for, you know, or maybe somebody's already done this, to try to identify some countries that will be in particular trouble um, based on the sort of criteria that, you know, you, the, the way that you're thinking about the world. You know, where might we see this all start, you know, to the extent that there's going to be a great solvency crisis as a result of, you know, us deciding to borrow our way out of a global pandemic, where might it start? Um, and then maybe you using the impetus for, for the need for reform sooner rather than later. Um, one of the things that I think that I took out of COVID-19 is that it's, you know, there, there are two times of crisis. There's one that I, you know, alluded to in my earlier comment to Laura. We have these localized crises of specific institutions, crises of governance, um, crises of, you know, solvency. You know, we're seeing that right now with the Boy Scouts. Um, you know, maybe the, the NRA is another example of that. Um, we saw it with the city of Detroit, you know, where you have these big problems where they're localized, where there are political log jams. And I wonder if the problem that you're identifying is a problem that's so big that you can't really re ring fence the carnage and then it becomes, you know, very hard to come up with new ideas in the moment and to exploit that sense of crisis to reach some great settlements that's really challenging. And maybe Puerto Rico is an example where they haven't made a ton of a ton of progress on, you know, that country, you know, I guess that territory's solvency crisis, despite the best efforts and talents of a lot of people. So I, I would just encourage you to continue to think about this. And, to, you know, I guess my question is, do you have a sense of where, you know, the fire might start and, you know, what we might want to do to get in front of it? Yeah, in terms of where the fire might start, I mean, you the the fire was starting even before covid in primarily sub-saharan africa right um and you'll see you know the first three countries that have raised the maybe we want to do the i met the common framework thing are you know ethiopia chad and zambia so that's kind of going back and saying look the countries that we're having trouble to begin with they have to continue to have the trouble right um and you know and they also have a lot of trouble with the corruption issues and all the other things that I'm talking about so I'm guessing that that's likely where it's going to go in terms of how it's going to spread I I think you're right that it's so diffuse um that it's hard to know exactly where and how um in part I think that the, the autopsy on the various industries that have been suffering globally from, from COVID-19 have, have not been completed yet. Um, and so I think that needs to be done. The IMF and the World Bank have been doing some of this work. Some of the debt cancellation groups, including Jubilee and especially Eurodata out of, out of Europe have done some, uh, some of these studies. Um, and so I think that that's something that you wanna pay attention to. Um, you know. A lot of it also kind of depends not just on the sort of the debt and the finance element, but there's a whole discussion right now about trade, right? Um, the USTR's office now has, you know, Brad Sester's just joined as special counselor and he's very interested in issues of sort of tax justice and that kind of thing as well. And so that could have these types of, uh, that could have implications for the types of things that you're thinking about too. So I think it's hard to know, I'm guessing Sub-Saharan Africa, because that's sort of where it's starting, but, it could spread or or not. You know, it's hard to know. But yeah, but thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lanau, for your presentation. We will now be moving on to Professors Casey and Macy. Great. Thank you, Vera. Um, so I'm Professor, I'm Tony Casey. Uh, my colleague jo Josh Macy's on, but uh, he'll probably jump in in the Q&A. Um, so here, I'll put a thing. My slides on. Sorry about that. Okay, so, um, sorry, one second. All right, so in this paper, Josh and I uh, kind of jump into the discussion, the longstanding discussion on 
then you reform. And um, what we want to do is highlight some, what we'll say is, you know, shortfallings in the current uh, venue reform proposals, uh, and then propose principles and alternatives of our own. So we have kind of a, a high level, big picture reform proposal that uh, focused on two principles. Um, and then in this, we also importantly introduce um, the, the um, considerations of global form shopping into venue reform. And what we wanna talk about that is we, we think it's really important and has been kind of discussed much less than other areas of venue reform is the, the impact of global form shopping has been less front and center. All right, so uh, before, we, before I start into the substance, I, I think I should give two kind of definitional uh, starting points. We use venue and forum very particularly, kind of um, the way you hear them often in the civil procedure context. Uh, in the bankruptcy context, you often hear them used interchangeably, but we wanna use venue to mean the choice of a court within a legal system. So if you're choosing between the Southern District of New York versus the Southern District of Texas, that's a venue decision. Forum, we use to mean the choice of a system so if you're deciding between courts in the United States or courts in Singapore, that's a forum decision. And so to, to, because those decisions are different but related, we wanna have different terms to refer to them. All right, so with, with that definitional baseline, um, here are two principles of reform. We, we suggest that you know, the first and foremost, whenever you can, the way to solve venue and forum shopping is to resolve substantive inconsistencies that drive some of that shopping. And the reason for that is often the worst shop forum or venue shopping is the one that's shopping for an inconsistent law in one place or another. Um, now that only goes so far and I'll talk about why. Uh, and then the, the next step is to put in place a, a mechanism for pre-commitment to and what we'll talk about is pre-commitment to the method of choosing the venue or forum. And that'll be very important to getting the optimal solution uh, to venue and forum reform. All right. So why is this uh, a, an issue and why do we kind of talk about it now? Um, as I think many of you know, venue reform has been a topic for quite a while. Uh, it's gained traction in recent years and you know, it's kind of always a, a political hot potato, but it, it may, you know, at any point may be something that, that actually moves forward. And so we wanna think about what that should look like. And as I'll talk about a little later, global forum shopping is on the rise and we do think that affects things uh, significantly. So, before, you know, so we have a few starting assumptions, starting points that I want to uh, kind of set out there um, that inform where we end up. So first, we are of the view that domestic venue shopping does occur. We, we think that's uncontroversial uh, and somewhat undeniable. And by that, I mean, lawyers will shop for the venue that is most beneficial to their client. Anyone who has practiced knows that that's a key consideration that lawyers have. Uh, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, that's what lawyers are supposed to do. The, the best court for your client, if you have a choice between two courts, you will, you will make that choice. Now, there's nothing wrong with a lawyer doing that. There may or may not be issues with the system allowing that. I'll come back to that. In bankruptcy, that choice is especially broad. Uh, and on the slide there, you see the, the bankruptcy venue statute. So the debtor can file anywhere where the debtor has a domicile, residence, principal place of business, principal ask, ask, or location with principal assets, or anywhere where its affiliate is filed and it affi its affiliate being able to file in the places the affiliate has those things I listed. Importantly then, if you have one subsidiary incorporated somewhere, that'll be their domicile, the whole enterprise can file there. 
If you have one subsidiary with principal assets in one venue, the whole enterprise can file there. And that allows debtors to kind of create venue by moving assets or incorporation, and that becomes very broad. And so given this broad choice, the question becomes, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Now, as I said, our assumption is venue shopping does occur, but we are that is not the same as saying venue shopping is bad or venue shopping is good. It's also not the same as saying that judges are necessarily competing for cases and changing the law to get cases. We're a little skeptical on that story, which has been out there for a while. We're just saying lawyers do shop for venues. And some of that will be good and some of that will be bad. The good venue shopping is, hey, we want an efficient process. We're going to file in the court that's most efficient. We want a really good judge. And, and by good, we mean just good, efficient, understands the law, is an expert. We're going to file in front of that judge. Um, we want to avoid local uh, political influence or bias that might get in the way of the way the law should be applied kind of if, you know, in, a, in a neutral way. Or you could have bad venue reform shopping. So the, the example I gave earlier, which I think is always bad, is you, if you have two venues with substantive law differences, you, lawyers will choose the, the substantive law and that you shouldn't be able to change the legal rule by deciding where to file. So that, that's problematic. Or lawyers will choose judges that they know are debtor friendly or they'll seek out other certain biases that change the, the neutral application of the law in their favor. And again, we don't blame the lawyers for this, but we ask whether or not we want a system that allows that. So there's good, there's bad. We do not take in this paper a position on whether it's more good or more bad empirically. And I'll, you know, we don't know the answer. Lots of people have, have worked on that and there is evidence in both directions. Uh, we don't take a position. And importantly, we don't think you need to in order to get to optimal venue and forum reform. Um, and so what we want to suggest is that regardless of whether or not it's mostly bad or mostly good, if you can reform in a way that eliminates the bad and increases or preserves the good, do it, right? And that's the optimal outcome either way. And we'll, we'll talk about how you might get there. Another bad aspect of venue shopping, and this would be that it creates unnecessary and wasteful costs. Now here, this would apply for good or bad venue shopping. So let's say I'm trying to get the most efficient venue. If I have to spend money on economically meaningless transactions to, to secure the good venue, that's a waste. Now, if I want to get a, a venue for a bad reason, for bias, if I have to engage in economically meaningless transactions in order to secure that venue, that's also a waste. And we do see that in our system. Because venue is bundled with principal place of assets, bundled with principal place of business and state of incorporation, you then have to move your state of incorporation if you want a certain venue or move your assets if you want a certain venue, move your principal place of business. And by bundling those, one decision will drive the other. Either the venue decision drives the location of assets or the assets drives the venue, and they're not meaningfully connected. There's no reason they should be connected. And to give an example of a wasteful transaction, you know, this is an article noting that people, uh, debtors will open up an office in a certain town in order to get into a certain court. Again, we might want those debtors to be able to get into that court, but if that's true, we should let them get into the court without renting an office they don't need. So that's a, that's a form of cost that venue shopping has under our current system, regardless of whether it's good or bad. All right, so with these starting points, we want to propose optimal venue form. As I said earlier, if you can reduce bad venue shopping and preserve good venue shopping, that's the best way to go. Uh, and 
when you're doing that, you also need to account for global forum shopping. I've mentioned that a few times. What do I, I mean by that? So starting points on global forum shopping. Again, our views, empirically, we know global forum shopping happens. You know, the idea here would be a debtor with assets in the US could file chapter 11 in the United States or because it has a connection to the United Kingdom or because it can create a connection to the United Kingdom can file or initiate proceedings in the United Kingdom or in Singapore. And then when it has a judgment, it can come back to the United States and seek recognition of the foreign judgment under chapter 15. Now chapter 15 allows for a US court to enforce, recognize and then enforce foreign judgments. The US recognition rules are especially liberal. It's easier to get recognition of foreign judgments in the US than a lot of other places. Because of those liberal recognition rules, it's become easier for debtors in the US who might like really the US is the main place where they should and would normally file to shop globally and file somewhere else and then get enforcement. Now, once we see that happening, you then see other jurisdictions perhaps competing for cases. And particularly in the United Kingdom and Singapore, we've seen recent reforms that have attracted debtors to those jurisdictions. Again, it might be good reforms, right? So it might be good competition, it might be bad, but it is competition. And note that the foreign jurisdictions can compete on substance and basically on all levels much more directly than a domestic venue. Because if you are the UK, you can change the law to get debtors to come there, the substantive written legislation law. Delaware can't do that, right? Delaware is bound by the, you know, Delaware bankruptcy courts are bound by the US bankruptcy code. You know, there are ways to, you know, theories about how judges may or may not, you know, attract cases in their rulings, but they can't change the statute the way the United Kingdom and Singapore could. So competition is easier on that global front. And with chapter 15 recognition, you, you, go, to the, you go to the foreign country, you come back, you get recognition. Now, how does that interact with venue reform? Well, here's the current proposal that's been on the table for a while. It's, you know, we, we're gonna reform domestic venue by saying you no longer can file where you're incorporated and you no longer can file based on a subsidiary's filing, right? You have to go to your principal place of business. And if you wanna have an affiliate, it's gotta be your parent affiliate. If that reform is enacted, right? It will push cases, large cases at least, abroad, right? If your debtor was choosing to file in a US venue that it liked, one particular district, and the venue reform now says you can't file in that particular district anymore. The benefit of chapter 11 to you has gone down or the relative costs have gone up because you have to go to a venue you might not have chosen, which means that all else equal, the, the foreign jurisdiction, and I use the UK and Singapore because they're very common and the trend has been that they've been attractive. You know, Singapore becomes more attractive than the US if you now have had certain kind of avenues cut off. And you know, to give an example, uh, Singapore one or two years ago had a, a, a court opinion where they allowed roll-ups in dip financing. So um, I think most of you probably know what roll-ups are, but you know, it is a creditor, secured creditor friendly uh, provision in debtor possession financing. The debtor might, want to give a roll up because they want to get the financing in place. Some jurisdictions allow it, some don't, some have very kind of tight restrictions on it. When Singapore said we're going to allow roll ups, they cited to and basically followed New York precedent. So now you, you want to roll your debtor, you know you need a roll up in your debtor in possession financing, you file in New York. Let's say venue says, venue reform says you can't file in New York anymore you have to file in a different US venue. That doesn't allow roll-up. 
Well, now Singapore looks very attractive, right? Because it allows roll-ups under the same terms that New York did, and you can't go to New York, right? That's where venue reform could push debtors abroad. And of course, that's the exact opposite of what venue reform would want to do. You're getting cases farther from home, and you're giving these other forums an incentive to compete for cases by changing substantive law, which again, venue reform should want to, to do the opposite of. So that's the, the interaction between the two. All right. Um, so given that baseline, what do we do? What, is, what should venue reform look like? Our proposal has two parts to it. And the first is very straightforward. It's not new. That is, at the starting point should be, you should resolve substantive inconsistency that's driving venue shopping. Now, you, you, you can do that. The way to do it would be the Supreme Court resolves circuit splits or Congress sees inconsistencies and makes the law clearer. Some people say, wait, that's unrealistic. We're not gonna be able to change how quickly the Supreme Court does things. Congress might not be trusted to solve those disputes. Maybe, but, but the truth is any venue reform relies on one institution to do something. And that institution is likely a court or a legislature. And so if we're talking about things they should or could do, this is the starting point. They should do this when possible. This doesn't solve all venue shopping it reduces a certain type of bad venue shopping. It's basically neutral on global form shopping. So it doesn't get to that part of the problem that we're talking about. And that is because you, you can't solve the inconsistencies in global uh, bankruptcy law through domestic legislation. It's very hard to do that. There, there are ways that with recognition you might get there, but, but it's difficult. So. The starting point is resolving consistency whenever possible. That often won't be possible. That often won't be what's driving the venue shopping. And if it's the foreign issue, it's hard to do. So then we get to the more important part, to provide a mechanism for pre-commitment. Now, pre-commitment is not a new idea either, although we're going to have a new refinement to it that I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. The existing kind of main proposal out there in the literature comes from Bob Rasmussen and Randall Thomas. So they suggested about 20 years ago, we should allow debtors to pre-commit to the venue of their choice. The reason that is beneficial is it, it changes the moment in which you select venue. You're not selecting venue when litigation has already started, when you know which law it is your, your real, this bankruptcy is going to turn on. And you're doing it before creditors engage in the, in the relationship with the debtor. So if you pre-commit when you incorporate to file bankruptcy in Chicago, you, your creditors will see that and your creditors will punish you if that's bad form shopping and reward you if it's good form shopping, right? All stakeholders now will say, what is gonna be the, the, the outcome, the court that handles our interests best? And they're going to you know, take their interests and say the debtor, change this or pay me more interest. Local inter interests may also have a say. say. So if you're a, a large firm that, that locates its headquarters in Chicago and you got tax breaks for that, they might also say, we want you to commit to file bankruptcy here, right? So they get to have their say in the venue choice as well when it's ex ante. It also, by giving you choice, unbundles the, the venue from incorporation, from principal place of assets. You don't have those meaningless economic transactions. That allows you to keep the good and reduce the bad but it has shortcomings. Well, one shortcoming is things change. You know, we might ultimately have new judges, new circuit splits. You might have efficiency in one court that was there five years ago is gone now. You might have different creditors come into the relationship. And so if you have pre-commitment and you wanna make it real, it has to be hard to amend. And if it's hard to amend, you have this rigidity that could cause the venue that was chosen to originally to no longer be a good fit. 
And if that happens, another cost is, then you might have people go abroad again. Because if you commit and the US law allows you to commit and you wanna get out of that commitment, well, go to Singapore, right? As long as Sing if Singapore doesn't enforce that commitment, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but if they don't, maybe some less trustworthy foreign jurisdiction that's really not competing on excellence, but just trying to get debtors to come there might say, yeah, we're gonna ignore that pre-commitment. So we don't quite get the perfect solution. We also don't get a solution for non-adjusting creditors. Now, it's very hard to get a solution that helps non-adjusting creditors, ones who don't deal with the debtor in the, mar in the marketplace. So the, you know, their version doesn't get to it. The beginning of our version won't get to it, but I, I'll talk about a tentative proposal there. Um, all right, so how do we refine this? How do we get a better solution? It's, it's small, but, but important. You allow the debtor to commit not to venue, but to the choice mechanism for venue. And here the debtor says, maybe it's always Delaware, period, end. Because the creditors that we are dealing with now have priced in the possible rigidity and said it's not that big a deal. Or we, the debtor, always get to choose because they trust us or we're paying a high interest rate for that. Or always Delaware, but if 70% of the creditors vote otherwise, then we move, right? Give them the choice. We could let a neutral referee decide. You could flip a coin. However you want, the debtor can pre-commit to the mechanism ahead of time. Now that commitment needs to include in it any ways you might or might not amend the rules, which likely, you know, if it's 70% of creditors can move venue, then set, you, you would need at least 70% of creditors to change that rule as well. Why is that beneficial? Well, just like Rasmussen and Thomas, it's a market solution. The creditors will put pressure on the debtor when they make bad venue choices, like competing for the managerial reasons. They'll reward them when they make good venue choices, competing for efficiency or expertise. It minimizes that rigidity because the stakeholders are negotiating about the rules for change, and they'll know better than a legislature ex ante where the likely rigidity uh, problems are, where holdup is likely to occur. It's a total unbundling. You're not saying venues tied to an office. You're not saying venues tied to state of incorporation. So in that sense, it increases venue choice, but it reduces the ability to make bad venue competition, to shop for substantive law that hurts creditors, to shop for debtor biased judges. It may also reduce global forum shopping because you can include in the provision to say, hey, you know, maybe we'll choose a forum that's the UK. Now, just like the Rasmussen and Thomas, the foreign, the global forum, actually, the foreign forums might not enforce that. And so on the negative side, the bottom of the slide, I know you can't completely solve global forum shopping. Nothing really can, but you can reduce it. And again, we don't solve with the, the way I've given it so far, the non-adjusting creditor problem. Now to those, pro, to those last two points, in the paper, we discuss ways to maybe get around them. Now, I, we're more tentative on these and we'd love to hear people's thoughts on them in particular. So you could tweak recognition rules a little bit to, to solve these on the margin. So for example, you could say that chapter 15 recognition is broad unless you violated a venue selection mechanism in order to select that for global forum, right? If, if that violation is there, then we might have a thumb on the scale against recognition. Now we're hesitant here because that could really kind of get in the way of the flow of, of cross-border insolvency. With non-adjusting creditors, the solution domestically is easy. Non-adjusting creditors domestically, you should, it's our first point, resolve inconsistency, have a law that applies in all venues, very clear about what non-adjusting creditors get. Right? We don't have that, but I think almost everyone in this call 
has thought about that. And, and I think there's a pretty general view that like non-adjusting predators are a problem that other solutions don't solve. A substantive rule that just solves that is the way to go. And uniformity across venues would be the obvious solution to shopping based on that. Venue shopping. With global form shopping, it's harder again. You might tweak the recognition rule. And the way to do that would be to say something like, we have our liberal recognition of foreign judgments, but like any comedy rules and recognition rules, there's a public policy exception. If the foreign proceedings violate US public policy, we now might not recognize. You might input non-adjusting predators as a form of domestic public policy. You can't choose a foreign forum that takes advantage of creditors who weren't part of the bargain, right? That's, and if you do, you've got to make them whole on the side before you seek recognition. Again, we're tentative on this because it, it complicates cross-border insolvency in, in, in ways that are hard to, to fully kind of predict. And we're, we're going to work, through, we're working through that. And again, I want to hear your thoughts on it, but that's one way to potentially get to those two problems. But even, with, even without those two tweaks, right? What we want to suggest is our proposal is, you know, better than the current reform because it increases good venue shopping and decreases bad venue shopping and accounts partially for global venue, global form shopping. And it has less rigidity than the Th Thomas Rasmussen proposal. And it gets us better on global form shopping even without those tweaks and may allow us to add those tweaks to, uh, to, to, to further reduce the global issues. All right. That is the proposal, and I will take questions. Thank you very much, Professor Casey. <clears throat> We're going to generally stick to the pattern that we have uh, set to this point. We'll start with fellow panelists, but I will make a quick note um, that there is someone in the audience who has raised their hand, and we additionally have Professor Rasmussen here, so uh, if he would like to speak, we'll, we'll happily recognize him also. But with that said, we will begin with Professor Westbrook. Well, Tony, really good paper, really interesting paper. I agree with much of what you say. Uh, I'm less clear about your solution than I am about your statement of the problem. But the most valuable contribution, it seems to me, is to link domestic venue problems with international domestic, uh, international uh, venue problems. That's a really important link and one that has not been adequately discussed. Uh, we did have a, a, a large symposium at uh, Texas uh, about a month ago. Uh, Texas International Law Journal did a symposium on uh, the competition worldwide for large bankruptcy cases. And, and that's just a really important part of the overall venue problem. And you're quite right, of course, that it can't be increasingly, at least for large companies, the domestic venue problem can't be separated from the international one. Um, at places in your paper, you seem to deal with or seem to assume that under Chapter 15, recognition is a given. Um, and, and I think that's not true. Uh, a case like Petro illustrated, illustrates that that's not true. There's a large amount of recognition that happens because there's no one around sufficiently sophisticated to object. But we certainly could have had a rule it actually takes your non-adjusting predator rule and goes a step farther and says that if a company should have filed uh, its main proceeding in the United States, uh, we will not enforce uh, a resulting uh, bankruptcy judgment or bankruptcy procedures uh, in other countries uh, that, um, you know, for that, that country. Um, something like reciprocity with uh, London, for example, would make that work very well. Um, although, of course, it would not work for Sunkist. Uh, uh, bankruptcy havens. Um, as far as substantive changes are concerned, I just, I'm a little bit more skeptical than you all are after 25 years of international negotiations and organizations. I, I'm just not, that's going to take a long, long time. Um, it may be that we could arrive at some substantive uh, coordination with specific uh, other important jurisdictions, and, and that may well be something to pursue. But competition makes that a problem. It's just very attractive to be able to say, oh, well, you don't have to fool with that silly US rule if you file here um, in our sun-kissed haven. Um, 
John Pato and I have suggested that the first thing you need in international bankruptcy is a guide to Four Seasons Hotels. Uh, and, and I'm afraid there's, there's a good deal of that going on. Just one final point I'll make. Non-adjusting is a concept that usually refers to particular creditors like tort creditors, tax creditors, and small suppliers. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it's also not clear, I think, from the, from the evidence, and nobody's done this study, to show us the extent to which a relatively uh, distant factor like, like bankruptcy choice of venue, for God's sakes, which will see arcane, seem arcane to many investors, uh, actually gets priced into and therefore produces the necessary market competition um, uh, when, when uh, something like that is put into a charter. So I think that's another area that we really have to think about carefully. Anyway, your, your paper does a great service and thank you for doing it. Great, I, pre I really appreciate that. Um, very helpful things to think about. Um, to be clear on the, the point about uh, global form shopping and substance, I think we're in total agreement. Um, we're not optimistic that you can resolve the substantive inconsistencies between two countries. Like, like you could try for treaties, but 100%, you know, we could do that with the UK and Singapore, perhaps, who are very kind of sophisticated and, you know, I, I, I would say, kind of honest brokers in the competition. They're trying to, you know, provide quality jurisdictions. And then, you know, those three jurisdictions come to an agreement and someone else jumps in and says, hey, here, we're going to say managers get the whole thing, I, 100%. And that was why what we suggested was you could perhaps tweak the recognition to say, if you had a pre-commitment that you violated, we're no longer going to allow you to recognize that in the US. <clears throat> now, I think what you said was maybe there's a bit of that already in the system. Uh, this is your first point that you know, we sh recognition isn't a given. And if you should have filed in the US, it, it perhaps shouldn't be recognized. Vitro is an example, although, I mean, the court kind of goes out of its way to say, the reason we're not recognizing is you included this insider voting, which was more about the substance than the choice of where you file. Right. Um, and there are lots of examples, but you're 100% right. There are lots of examples of kind of tenuous links being recognized, but you're right that it might be because no one really objected so much. Um, I think our point would be, you know, if no one's objecting that, that's not so bad. The, the, the rule should look closely when it's a non-adjusting creditor who's lo losing out, um, or if you're violating a, a forum uh, choice provision to get there. And then, you know, one objecting creditor might be enough to get the non-recognition um, that you say you, you say might exist already, but but we agree should exist in a world where we have that reform. Um, yeah, I think Josh wants Just to- Just very quickly to add to that, um, I took it that one of Jay's points was that empirically we don't always get recognition. So our like hawkishness uh, might be overstated. And I, I don't think, at least I don't think that sort of resolves my concerns in any way, because if it is, I think there are two scenarios. One, you can liberally forum shop, in which case empirically what we're concerned about, I think is right. Scenario two is that the United States starts becoming more attentive to protecting uh, its, its own uh, uh, bankruptcies, in which case I think you can expect reciprocal behavior, which is problematic in its own right. And so, you know, you see this in, in tax cases, um, and I don't see what would be unique about bankruptcy that would, uh, I think, prevent territories and regions from, from protecting their own bankruptcies. And that could lead to splintering and territorialism that would itself be problematic. Indeed. And one last, just on the non-adjusting creditor point, um, I also agree with you there. We kind of made a point of not defining non-adjusting creditors uh, because I think that's a separate question, right? So to the extent, you know, whoever's making the policy defines someone as non-adjusting creditors, here's how you treat them that way. And, you know, I think everyone agrees tort victims are non-adjusting creditors. Um, then, you, you know, small vendors, it gets a little more complicated the further you go. You know, whatever your definition would be, that's, you know, there's a long literature on that, um, would feed into the, okay, here's the rule for, for how we think about them in this system. Uh, so I, so I call the next person, I guess, uh, George. 
Tony and Joshua, it's a, it's a very nice paper and a very elegant proposal, and I like how it builds on the Rasmussen uh, Thomas um, uh, suggestion. So my, my question actually goes to the relationship between scholars and practice. So as you said, it's been 15 years or more since they made that suggestion. Has anybody adopted that suggestion? And if not, why not? And if not, um, what makes you think that yours is going to be any more attractive to them? Is it just a question of getting out there and marketing, or are there some other? Is there some other source of resistance? Because, you know, I, I'm I'm the among the most guilty of this, but we have to be careful about throwing out proposals that no one's going to adopt without sort of thinking a little bit or projecting a little bit about that. I know that's an unfair question, but I'll throw well, it out there. It is fair, you know, and, and some people read drafts and, and came at it from a different angle of. Do you really think your point about the Supreme Court, they're ever going to get bankruptcy right or they're ever going to resolve splits? And one of my responses, well, that might be more likely than venue reform from Congress. And, you know, ultimately, then you're, you're saying, all right, like, perhaps it's, you know, the Supreme Court can't, isn't going to be very efficient resolving splits. Perhaps the venue reform that um, Bob and Randall propose isn't going to happen. Although, you know, there, the other venue reform proposal, the, the one on the table that has also been out there for a while and hasn't happened, you know, as it gains traction, there's a, a I, I imagine there's a point at which Congress just says, all right, we're debating it now and it actually could happen. And you wanna have your proposals out there for that moment, right? And I think we've seen that over time, like the, the small business bankruptcy reforms, right? Like. 20 years ago, someone might say, well, you're never going to talk about priority. You know, we, you, can, you guys can write about it. You're never going to get out of absolute priority. Well, there was a moment when for small businesses, they said, all right, we're going to think about it. And those topics and ideas were on the table for that. And I, 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 that's the way I view the paper is like, we're academics. We get ideas out there. The, how you get it through Congress is not necessarily my job. But I think this is as likely as any other venue proposal to be seriously considered. My question, Tony, is not about Congress, it's about private parties, you know? Uh, do you think that they're gonna put this in their charters or, or what have you? Because presumably they're not the same frictions with private parties. Oh, I see, I thought you were saying a, a law to specifically provide for it. No, I'm, um, I'm thinking to the extent that your proposal is, hey, put this in your charter the way that Bob and Randy said, put it in your charter. Uh, and we haven't seen, to my knowledge, many companies pick that up. So what makes it, what makes you think that they're more likely to pick yours up? Well, well, there is, I mean, so I think when they wrote, it was unclear whether it, it without legal change was legal. You know, we have seen in Delaware, not bankruptcy, uh, charters now with venue selection provisions and the Delaware Supreme Court has said, we're going to enforce those. Um, I, you know, I, I suppose it's an open question whether if it ever federally, the federal court could say, no, you can't, but they haven't done that. So that at least suggests an opening where, all right, we now know that, you know, one state Supreme Court has said you can put other venue selection in your charters and people have done it. And after that case, lots of people did it, whereas before not so many did. So it, it might be just waiting for the first test. Uh, I'm not sure that, but I'm not sure that that's not true either. Can I just jump in really quickly? Uh, two things. One, um, I think compared to the Thomas Rasmussen proposal, one thing is that's a sticky proposal. It's it, There are costs to doing it and in that you have fewer, you're less discretion to revise ex post. But second, I think I'll just challenge your assumption a little bit. You know, I think even if no one ever, ever adopts this, it's useful to know, assuming, and I say this obviously sarcastically, that ours is the platonic ideal of venue and forum reform. It's then a good metric based on which to judge other uh, existing venue and forum rules. And so it, it, it it's still, I think, empirically and epistemically useful, even if no one ever does it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We talked to a bankruptcy judge and we asked about our proposal and he said, oh, it's just academic jumbo mumbo or something. Um, so I guess, uh, Jared, 
very quickly because I want to give Bob a chance to speak. I see he has his hand up in the audience, um, but I would actually be somewhat more bullish than George that something like this is possible because one of the things that the recent emergence of the Southern District of Texas as a major bankruptcy destination teaches us is that you really only need to get like one person at Kirkland and Ellis to decide this is a good idea. And then all of a sudden it's a really good idea. So I think it's an exciting proposal. Um, all right. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, Judge Bonifel. Judge Bonifel, you have been permitted to uh, speak. You can unmute now. Well, I, I didn't ask to speak, but... Um... <laughs> they, someone said there was, you were in the queue, sorry. So I don't really have anything to add. Okay. Um, uh, Bob Rasmussen. Okay, uh, hey guys, uh, great paper. Any paper that cites me is by definition a great paper. Um, just so I, as I said to you guys privately, I'll, I'll say it publicly, um, I love this proposal. Um, I wish I had thought of it. So to the extent that um, this changes what Randall and I thought about, it's, it's all a change for the good. Um, substantively, um, and this came up a little bit of a comment that Josh said, uh, there's a flavor here to the paper about um, you know what the United States should do in light of competition, what we should do to to sort of, you know, make things better. Um, is that a little too parochial? Um, you know, you sort of, the paper's like, well, you know, Singapore is out there being aggressive. UK's out there being aggressive. Is part of the message, and a little bit aside from the, the, the venue point, should the US uh, be affirmatively looking at this market? You know, not so much to, not, or not only, you know, ensure that American companies um, find the law attractive, uh, but, you know, should uh, Congress, in thinking about the bankruptcy code, um, have a broader purview and perhaps attract companies with minimal context in the United States to actually file for a chapter reorganization, take advantage of our restructuring community? Yeah, so I think this, we, we, we strayed away from having, uh, from going deep into this question because it, it, it's hard and important. Um, and we didn't want the paper to be twice as long. Um, so the, the, the real issue, right, is, this goes to race to the top, race to the bottom. Um, you know, do we start saying, or we're going to try to compete on substance, but also on um, our willingness to take non non local cases uh, and compete with with the UK and compete with Singapore? Um, and there's two forms of competition: to keep ours and to get theirs. Um, you might say half of it, not do half of it, don't do the other half. Um, if, if we think substantively it's for the good, I, I'm all for it. But again, that's a hard question. I think the chapter 16 proposals that are out there that look kind of like schemes of arrangement in the UK and Singapore might be viewed as the, a first step along the, those lines. Um, and, and again, I agree, like we should be in that game if that game is making things better. Uh, and I you know, I, I'm hesitant to, without kind of modeling out, making a long paper, like say like, oh, it's always going to be raced to the top, uh, substantively in global form shopping, um, or more to the top than the bottom. And I think as, as Jay suggested, like, once we get in that, other jurisdictions that we might not like jump in, and then it's like, oh, what, what do we open up? I'm cognizant that we have gone uh, over our <laughs> allotted period and, and time to break for lunch. Um, that said, um, professors Casey and Macy, there are several questions in the Q&A, if you don't mind me reading those aloud now. Sure. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'll begin with the first submitted anonymously. Um, what, what if corporation incorporates and selects a bad state? Um, five years later, it turns out the lender wants the venue to be a good state. Um, and, and, and they're saying good state and bad state, both in uh, quotations. Um, the corporation would want to amend its articles of incorporation. Would they be permitted to under your proposal? Yeah, so, so the key to our proposal is they lay out the mechanism for choosing venue, which includes the mechanism for amending choice. Um, and so you wanna say uh, we get to amend at will, that's fine, because then your lenders will price that in. You want to say we got to get lender consent or we've got to pay our lenders X amount of the debt. 
right? That's, it's all market controlled there. And the reason for that, and this was the refinement on, on Bob, Bob's idea was, you, know, you got to set an amendment rule. And just like we trust the market for setting the venue rule, we would trust the market for setting the amendment rule. The next question um, from the attendees is, it seems to me that a federal law would have to require venue specification and charter that states uh, would have to follow um, together with a default rule if no venue specification exists. Yeah, I think you're, you, you would need a default rule if you say you can choose. Uh, you'd need to say, if you don't choose, here's the rule. And that, like, I think for us, that could be the new, you could use the new venue uh, reform proposal. You could use the old version. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have a strong view on that. Um, I'd rather it be unbundled from other things. So it might just be like, you know, find something that, that the debtor's unlikely to change ex ante if, without, well, if you're going by the default rule, choose something that's hard to change uh, because we want you to use the uh, pre-commitment, not uh, uh, ex post change of the default. It's kind of interesting too to game out, like if you make it uh, everyone, you know, if you use existing proposals and parties hate it, it might actually increase people's willingness to um, use our pre-commitment. Whereas if you send them to a really, uh, you know, if everyone goes to Delaware, maybe you'd reduce incentive to pre-commitment. Yeah, like so thinking about what the ideal default is, 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 you know, if you want to push for our proposal, maybe you should send everyone to West Virginia or something. <laughs> the final comment in the Q and A, um, <laughs> I, I think uh, responds to a point made regarding um, the race at the top or bottom um, and says that the direction of the race may depend on whether one is a debtor or creditor. So I, 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 don't, I don't view it that way, right? So I think like any given party will. When we talk to the top or the bottom, it's to um, you know, objectively better procedures or rules or substantive law. And, and so for example, if a judge is efficient without changing the law, just getting things done quicker. Um, that's good. And you know, if you happen to be a creditor who wants to get, you know, throw a wrench in everything, you'll view that as bad. But from a social value, that's good, right? Efficiency that gets the law right quickly is good. Efficiency that gets the law wrong is could be bad, right? Then it's a balance. And so when we talk top or bottom, it's like kind of from a Rawlsian social welfare point of view, you know, are they doing something that you know, gets the law wrong or has a bias in it? That's to the bottom. Are they do, doing something that you know, just perfects the law as we ideally want it? That's a race to the top. And that's, that's the way, that's the way we talk about, that's the way people in the, um, and we're borrowing this idea from the incorporation literature. You know, people, you, do you incorporate in Delaware? Is it a race to the bottom or the top? The race to the top is it makes the company more efficient and better. The race to the bottom is it allows managers to extract value. Uh, and that's the kind of way we're thinking. Yeah, are you, right. You can think of the race to the bottom as a distributional question about whether certain parties extract value in a way that makes the pie smaller. And I think one benefit of a pre-commitment is ex ante certainty and predictability is more likely to make the pie bigger. Then you have to get the distribution right um, but when thinking about the race to the top or race to the bottom, I think our, our initial concern is uh, the efficiency question, and then you still have to sort out the distributional things. But ex ante, I think they should be harmonious. Um, and I'll just, because someone posted, I think posted a follow-up, so they said, is roll up a race to the top or bottom? Uh, we don't know. Lot, like uh, Fred Tung has written about this. Um, I'm, I actually think roll-ups aren't so bad, but I, a lot of people think roll-ups are just a way to hide uh, an interest rate from people, and they're they're therefore bad. But you know the answer there is just what's your substantive view of, of allowing roll ups will tell you whether or not that's a race to the top or bottom. I also think you can roll ups could be good for some parties and bad for other parties. It it may not be a binary. Okay, again cognizant that we are running over our morning period allotment. Um, I, I will make one final note that um, Professor. Lanau um, posted a question right before having to move to uh, her own faculty workshop. And, and I'll now read that aloud if that's okay with the two panelists. Um, one mild question and comment is how bright the line is between the form and venue in all situations, given that you are particularly speaking 
uh, or that you were speaking on partially and on a partially international scale. Singapore versus New York or Delaware is clear, but how about, for example, countries in Europe after the recent EU directive on business insolvency? And maybe some uh, some of the model law directed insolvency reform led by uh, Yun Sichuel. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, is within any particular unit, uh, yes, a unit of judicial system, uh, you got to decide whether you're talking about how you're talking about it. So you might say the choice between France and the Netherlands is a venue versus forum or a forum, depending on how you view uh, the, the way that EU directive, which is, it allows local substantive law, but it, it has kind of um, guidance to it and principles to it. Um, I don't think that changes our analysis. It would, if we got into Europe, we would start talking, the terminology would get complicated, um, but like UK is clearly a separate forum. Singapore is a separate forum. Um, Europe's I think it's a bright line from the US's perspective, right? I mean, I think US proposals, you, the United States has much less authority to do things, or it has to act in much more aggressive ways as soon as you leave the, the United States. Um, and so even though there are, but you know, once you're in Europe, it's much grayer. But from the American perspective, that question about what types of substantive legal changes the US has to make in order to make venue or forum reforms effective, it varies tremendously based on whether it's within the, the American legal system or not. And so I think it is a bright line for the United States, um, but not, not, not for Europe. And I'll just say maybe what her question might have been getting at is, um, if I'm in the EU, our, our analysis should inform your evaluation of the EU directive because to the extent it creates or allows uh, substantive inconsistency, it, it encourages or, or doesn't or, or discourages uh, shopping within Europe. And that, those are interesting questions and, and not, not our, yeah, as Josh said, our view is just in the US or not, that's the way we're thinking about it here, but that's a whole nother uh, project that would be very interesting to think about. Thank you both very much um, for, for taking the additional um, question and answer time. Um, at this time, we will go ahead and break um, for, a, for, for lunch. Um, attendees, you can feel free to join, uh, panelists and attendees rather, you can feel free to join back around 1.30. Um, we will begin promptly 1.30 with presentation um, by uh, Professor Celius and Triantis. Um, and we'll close out the day with a presentation by Professor Westbrook. Um, I look forward to seeing you all then. Bye-bye.